Well, hello everyone. My name is Devin Knight, and I'm excited you're here to join us today for a day of Power Automate, really three hours of Power Automate. Uh, welcome from wherever you may be coming from. If you're in the morning, afternoon, or evening, or even if you're watching the recording, I hope you enjoy today's session. Again, a fairly full day on Power Automate. So many of you, we may realize, are very new to Power Automate, while some of you also may have a little experience with Power Automate. But we're going to give you a full spectrum of what you can do with the tool in today's class. We're going to cover a variety of topics within the application, not only how you can create things like cloud flows and automate various tasks that you might do, but we're also going to cover how you can do things like desktop flows and how can you automate more legacy applications that you might interact with. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up my slides to get us kicked off for this afternoon, the afternoon where I'm at anyways. I know for some of you I'm seeing in the chat are actually dialing in from different parts of the world and different, part, different time zones, of course. Uh, so very quickly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Devin Knight. I'm the president of training at Pragmatic Works. If you're not too familiar with Pragmatic Works, maybe you're new to us. We are exclusively a training company. We don't do anything but training. We solely focus on education. We solely focus on teaching you how to fish. And that's really our methodology at Pragmatic Works is to teach you how to work with these tools on your own. That's really how tools like Power Automate, which are part of the Power Platform, are meant for. They're meant for individuals to be able to solve problems on their own rather than having to go engage with maybe a data scientist or a data engineer or someone in IT. The goal with Power Automate is that you can solve some of these problems on your own and that's really what we focus in on and our training division is around how you can solve some of these problems on your own. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, primarily focused on the data platform side. So on Power BI, Azure SQL Server, that's my primary focus, but I do do quite a bit with Power Automate as well. In fact, I just taught a Power Automate class yesterday. So we do these quite a bit. I'm also an author of several books. You can find my books, of course, on Amazon. Uh, the books range from uh, Power BI, Power Automate, Power Platform, SQL Server. There's lots of different books that we've written over time that you can find on Amazon. And then I'm also a contributing member at the Jacksonville Power BI user group. The only reason I share that with you, the Power BI user group kind of needs to re-engage. It's been a little while with COVID, of course. But uh, the only reason I really share that with you is just to let you know that I'm dialing in from Jacksonville, Florida today. So I'm excited to be able to share with you all of this coming in from the East Coast uh, of Florida. Uh, I also blog quite a bit. You can uh, find my blog at devonnightsql.com. On my blog, I have, uh, as of late, have been blogging primarily about Power Automate. So you can actually find several newer blogs around Power Automate and some videos that go into more in-depth topics than really what we'll even have time to cover in today's session. And then, of course, uh, if you're someone that uh, does anything on Twitter, I tweet primarily about technology. You can find my Twitter there. Uh, and you can also email me. You can find my email on the screen as well. All right, so here's what our agenda looks like for today. It's a pretty packed agenda. We have a lot to cover in today's class, but we're gonna start by understanding basics of flows. So we're really gonna begin our session kind of covering what is Power Automate. For those of you that are very new, I realize we have people that are joining that have some experience and have some that don't have any experience. We need to do a little bit of level setting here early on. But we're going to understand the different types of triggers that you have available with inside of Power Automate. What is a trigger to begin with? So we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about how you can do things like creating flows with uh, conditional logic. So how can you make flows run under basically different filters and different conditions that you might want to engage with and interact with. We'll also talk about how you can create approval flows. So approval, approvals, if you're not familiar with this, is kind of the idea of, hey, before you do some action, I want to have some interaction with a human and give a human the ability to say yes or no to this before they actually move forward with it. And then we're also going to look at robotic process automation using the Power Automate desktop. Now, uh, within the Power Automate desktop, this is a feature that allows you to automate some of the more legacy applications that you interact with. Uh, now, I have seen some questions that have come in the chat. What do you need for today's class? Uh, well, a couple things uh, that's actually, actually worth noting here as we get started is one, yes, this session is recorded. In fact, you can even rewind this live. So if you wanna watch me do something again, just rewind it with inside of YouTube and you'll be able to go back and watch it again. So yes, this session is absolutely recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel going forward. So no worries there. Uh, part of the reason I tell you that is because if you don't have some of the things required for today's session, you can have time to go get those things and then come back and watch it again. So good news is even if you don't have yourself prepared uh, for the live class today, no problem, you'll be able to get yourself set up for later. 
Uh, what you could need, what you might likely need for today is a Power BI, excuse me, not Power BI, a Power Automate subscription. That Power Automate subscription, we will be touching on some premium features here and there, so a premium level one. Uh, but if you have a trial subscription to Power Automate, that will have everything you need as well. So you don't necessarily have to go swipe the credit card right now to be able to participate. You can actually sign up for a trial and follow along just fine. The last section of our class is uh, Power Automate Administration. So there we're going to talk about some best practices around using things like solutions, how you can kind of follow an application lifecycle management interface here where you can move your work from one environment to another environment. Perhaps you want to move from a dev environment to a QA environment to maybe a production environment. We'll spend some time talking about that towards the end of class as well. Okay. All right, so first things first, for those of you that are new to the Power Platform, I want to talk about what it is, why you should care about it, and really it can be helpful to know about some of these other members of the Power Platform that you see on my screen right now. Now, obviously today we're going to be focused on Power Automate. Uh, so I'll be kind of light on that for this one slide because we're going to spend the rest of our class talking about it. But the Power Platform really has four different members to it, which include Power BI, which is probably the mo most well-known of the tools. It also includes Power Apps. Power Automate, and Power Virtual Agents. Now, Power BI is your data visualization tool, an analytics tool. So whenever you need to be able to build out analytics and reports and dashboards, Power BI is your tool, okay? Power Apps is a rapid application, low-code development tool, meaning you, as a business user, can actually develop your own applications using Power Apps. You do not have to go to IT to get in a developer to build your app for you. You can do it on your own using Power Apps, and that's part of the power of what Power Apps can do. The idea with Power Apps would be you could take something that maybe is a very uh, manual or an analog process that you have today where someone's filling out a piece of paper, and you can convert that process into a digital process using Power Apps. Again, Power Automate will come back to, but Power Virtual Agents, the last one, Power Virtual Agents is a chatbot tool. By the way, we did a Learn with the Nerds on all four of these topics now. This uh, Power Automate session today is our last one that we have yet to cover, so you're getting that today. But we have sessions on all four of the topics that you see on my screen right now. If you check out our YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe. Book on the notifications as well to make sure that you're getting notified whenever we post some of these new things as well. But Power Virtual Agents is your chatbot tool. And Power Virtual Agents allows you to build out chatbots for your websites, for your teams, for uh, Slack, perhaps, if you're using other applications, but you can build out chatbots either for your internal employees or perhaps even for external customers to allow them to interact with a AI-driven chatbot. It's a really powerful tool. Now, all of the members of the Power Platform have something in common, and that is that they are geared towards the same audience. They are geared towards citizen developers. And if you haven't really heard that phrase before or heard that term before, you can think of a citizen developer as someone that's traditionally thought of as being on the business side of the house, not necessarily in IT. They can be, but not necessarily. But someone that's perhaps on the business side of the house that's really geared up to try and solve business problems on their own. And the technologies within inside of the Power Platform are geared towards those business users to be able to solve those problems on their own using technologies that are really designed for them. So that's kind of the idea behind the Power Platform is it is tools designed for business users to allow them to solve problems that they create or that they have. I shouldn't say that they create, but problems that they have that they want to solve. You don't have to go to someone else to solve them. You can do it on your own using the tools on the screen here. So uh, one thing also that all these tools have in common is a layer of data connect connectors. So a lot of data connectors are shared across all of these different tools. You also have a tool like AI Builder that's shared across all of these tools. And you even have a database storage feature known as Dataverse that you can use to store data that you collect perhaps in a Power App that you can then use with inside of a Power Automate solution. And you can even display the data from a Dataverse database inside of Power BI. So you can have data that's really shared across the entirety of the Power Platform using a tool like Dataverse. So Dataverse is part of and built with inside of the Power Platform as well. All right, so let's dig in and talk more specifically around Power Automate. And obviously, that's the focus of today's class. You can see I have Power Automate on my screen, but we're going to dig into it a little bit more in the coming up slide, so I'm going to leave it alone here. All right, so what is Power Automate? Let me take myself off camera here for a moment. Uh, so Power Automate is designed to help you minimize some of those repetitive tasks that you have without, throughout your day. So you, you only have so much time in your day to solve problems, right? Time is finite. There's only so many hours in a day. And if you are stuck doing some of the very repetitive tasks that you may have throughout your day, then you are, I don't want to say wasting time, but you're spending a lot of time on something that perhaps could be automated. 
And so the idea behind Power Automate is to take some of those more repetitive tasks that you have and build them into a workflow, they call them flows, in favor of giving you more time for more strategic work. So that's really the goal of Power Automate, is to give you more time to work on solving bigger business problems, to think about bigger business strategy. And so it puts the power to automate also in the hands of those that have the business problems. This kind of goes back to the previous slide. You as a citizen developer have the ability to create your own power automate solutions. So you don't have to go necessarily to IT to build out an automation for you. You can do it on your own. And again, the goal here is that it's designed to give you the confidence to kind of empower users with more control, freeing up IT to even work on their own more complex problems. IT has a lot of complex problems that are on their plate, so give them that, back that time to be able to work on those problems, give you back your time after you build out your automations, and everyone has hopefully a lot more time to work on more difficult work. So the idea behind Power Automate here is that it's an end-to-end -end holistic view of automation. Not only are you gonna be able to automate some of your more modern applications that you have, but you're also gonna be able to automate some of the more legacy applications that you have as well using tools like Power Automate Desktop, which we'll talk about in the latter part of today's course. So we will get into talking about the desktop application as well. Uh, the desktop application has a different purpose and a different set of tools, uh, a different reason why you would use the desktop application versus the uh, cloud version of Power Automate. And we'll talk about that as we get going through uh, our session, really the latter part of the day, we're going to talk about the desktop flows. The morning is going to focus on cloud flows. But before we even get to doing any kind of flows, we're going to talk about why you would use one versus another in our slide section here. All right. So again, this is kind of repeating what we talked about. But the ultimate goal and the vision of the Power Automate team at Microsoft is to make it so that people should not have to focus on tasks that don't necessarily require any unique human value. If it is something that you can have one of those birds with water in it kind of hit the button and do it for you, then why not build out an automation that can do those tasks for you? And that's really ultimately the goal with Power Automate is to give you back more time to work on other things. All right. Now, when inside of Power Automate, there are tons of connectors that are available to you, more than 470 different connectors, both to on-premises data sources as well as cloud data sources that you have the ability to connect into and automate. So if there's a particular type of data source that you're working with or a particular type of SaaS offering that you're using, something like, say, for example, Salesforce or, say, for example, Dynamics or OneDrive or Outlook.com, you can kind of tie in the various information from those sources using some of the connectors that are available. And if there's a connector that you want to work with that's not available, you can even build your own connectors. So you're not limited to just the connectors that are available to you by default. You can even build your own connectors and you can even have those connectors shared with others once you create them as well. You'll be able to find there's a connector library where you can find custom connectors that others have created and make it available for you to utilize them as well. So a lot of different ways that you can connect into data and use it. All right, let me take myself off screen here again. This is probably, while it might look like the most simple slide here, it is actually a pretty impactful one because here's what I'd like to describe to you on this slide is the difference between cloud flows and desktop flows. All right, so on the left-hand side, actually, tell you what, let's start with the right-hand side because this is how we're going to start our class is really the topics on the right. On the right-hand side, this is what you would consider cloud flows. Okay, so on the right hand side is cloud flows. Okay, so <clears throat> when would you design a cloud flow versus when would you design a desktop flow? Cloud flows are going to be for your more modern applications that have APIs. So if you're working with an application that has an API, you are likely going to stick with using a cloud flow. When you're designing cloud flows, all of your work is going to be done from your web browser. So the designer is your web browser. And I'll abbreviate here. We'll go to the next line. So all of the uh, design development of cloud flows is going to be done from the web browser. The other thing that's interesting to note about cloud flows is that they tend to be the orchestration tool or the organization tool for your desktop flows. So you can think of uh, cloud flows as your, as your organization of desktop flows as well. And what I mean by that is whenever you want to schedule or trigger a desktop flow, you're going to do that by leveraging a cloud flow. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as we get a little bit later in the day. But cloud flows are going to be one to connect into your more modern applications that have APIs. 
you're going to be doing your designing of it from your web browser. And then this will also be the tool that you use for orchestrating the execution of your desktop flows as well. All right, now when we think of the other end of the spectrum here, these are your desktop flows on the left. And when we think of desktop flows, think of desktop flows as when you want to automate older applications. Perhaps you might even consider them legacy applications that have been around in your company for decades, right? Every, every company that's been around for some time has some old application that you just can't get rid of and it's difficult to build out automations around. And so what ideally you could do if you really wanted to automate some of those more legacy applications is you could build out a desktop flow that can still automate it. So it doesn't have to be a more, more modern application to do automations with Power Automate. You can actually do it using desktop flows. Desktop flows, by the way, were, were a fairly recent acquisition of Microsoft, a little bit more than a year ago now, I believe, uh, of a company called Softomotive, and that allowed them to integrate in cloud flows and desktop flows together. They already had cloud flows for some time. Desktop flows are a little bit newer to the game, but they've already made a lot of enhancements to desktop flows since making that purchase. So again, desktop flows are for your older applications that do not have APIs. And so when you want to build out a desktop flow, your de designer is going to be the Power Automate desktop. Okay. And again, the purpose of using the desktop flows is for the older applications that you have in your environment that there's just not a nice, smooth way to connect into it like an API would have. All right, so if you get anything out of today, I know we're only 15 minutes in, but if you get anything out of today, hopefully it's the, that you will understand the difference between cloud flows and desktop flows. Think of cloud flows as your modern applications. Think of desktop flows as to the way you automate your more legacy applications. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and move forward. So what makes a cloud flow? A cloud flow really has two components that you absolutely must have, but more often than not, you also have a third component. That would be the last one you see on the list here. So cloud flows always consist of some kind of trigger. And we'll talk about what trigger types you can have as we move further along here. But every cloud flow is going to have a trigger. And essentially, a trigger, you can think of it as Power Automate listening and waiting for you to tell it when to run. So a trigger is what initiates the execution of your cloud flow. It doesn't actually know when to run until you tell it to here. So you'll use triggers for determining the execution time of your flows. And there's various types of triggers. We'll talk about those a little bit more as we go further along. But triggers are the beginning point of every cloud flow that you're going to have. Actions are going to be the things that you want to do. So while a trigger is going to start the execution of your flow, an action is the task that you actually want the flow to do. And so you can have multiple tasks that are part of your cloud flows that you can determine what different actions you want to do. What kind of different tasks do you need to do whenever your trigger runs? And then the conditional logic, the one that's above me here, conditional logic is things that you can build into your flows to kind of do like if then else statements, or maybe you want to filter your data down with a conditional logic, or there's different things that you can do with conditional logic, but it basically allows you to split up the execution of your flow based on some condition that happens. So if a certain uh, value is re reached, then you can have the flow run down one path versus another path. So you can set up conditional logic with inside of your flows, and we'll see this in action as we go through the course. All right. So some of the building blocks, again, are triggers, actions, and conditional logic. And you're kind of seeing that on my screen here. Don't worry, we will actually see that in action as we go through our uh, actual demonstrations here in a, sh a few short moments. But this is actually how you would see it inside of your web browser whenever you're working on cloud flows, as you would see an experience that looks something like this. Now, the other thing that you're going to find is when you're new to Power Automate, especially cloud flows, there is a nice feature built into Power Automate called templates. And templates are designed to allow you to get a kind of a jump start on using Power Automate. So if you're totally new to Power Automate, what I had did early on is I would search for some of the applications that I was trying to build automations or flows around. And so say, for example, I was trying to build an automation around Microsoft Dynamics. I could search the templates for Dynamics, and it would show me all of the flow templates that are already designed for me. So the great thing about how these templates work is these are templates that are pre-designed by someone else. Maybe they're by Microsoft, maybe they're by another user, and they've been published off to Power Automate that give you a little bit of a head start on building out your own solutions. And so you can start with a template and then start to modify it a little bit on your own. So that's actually going to be one of the first demonstrations that we see that we're going to jump into right now is building our first flow 
using a template. And then we're going to build on that and go much more in depth after we go through that first demonstration. All right, so let me go ahead and do this. I am going to be launching open my web browser. And I'm going to bring it over so we can actually see it here. Now, as a reminder, for those of you that maybe joined a little late, this is recorded. So uh, don't worry. If you need to catch up and, and watch some of this again later, you will be able to certainly rewind me. You can go back and forth. You can even rewind me live uh, as it's streamed through YouTube. They allow you to kind of rewind right now so you can watch something a second time. Now, the way that I'm going to start, and I'm going to take a step back because this actually signed me in already. So I want to take a step back so we can all be looking at really the opening screen here of Power Automate. But what we're going to do is I'm going to start by going to PowerAutomate.com. Okay, and you can actually see it already brought me there. This is the home screen for PowerAutomate.com as of today. And what this allows me to do is get started, but it also has a lot of information on the different types of things that you can do with Power Automate. So if you scroll down, you'll get some good information on why you might want to use Power Automate, some of the benefits that you're going to get from it. Well, there's a couple uh, case studies here that might be interesting to you. So definitely explore the site, see what might be helpful and useful to you. There's also a great community site. If you go to the community site, you can find a forum there where you can get uh, post questions that you might have, a lot of good information there as well. All right, but we're going to start by signing in. Uh, now, again, I am signing in with my account that I have from Pragmatic Works. If you don't have an account already, you could sign up for a free trial. Your company may block your trial capability. So if they do block it, that's okay. There are some other ways you can work around that. For instance, you could actually sign up for your own trial of Office 365. So you can sign up and really kind of build out your own trial tenant and then come to sign up for uh, Power Automate as your own separate tenant. So there's there's lots of ways that you can get started. If, you're, if your company does not allow you to sign up for a trial of Power Automate, you can kind of even circumvent that and sign up for your own Office 365 or Microsoft 365 trial and then psh, come in here and sign up for a trial on your own. All right, but for my case here, I do already have a Power Automate account. So I'm going to launch and sign in to my Power Automate account by hitting sign in. It's going to prompt me to sign in here, of course. So I'll go ahead and sign in using my Pragmatic Works account. And I have two factor authentication, so it's probably going to hit me on my phone to approve this. All right, we're good. Oh, got to look at it for one more second. There it goes. All right, we're in good shape. All right, so I've signed in to my Power Automate account. And this is your home screen that you see whenever you log into Power Automate. You can see I have some approvals that are kind of prompting me up top here as well. The thing that I'm going to be doing for today is I'm going to be starting with an environment that is totally new. So I'm actually going to be flipping up to the top here to a different environment that doesn't have anything in it already. Now, if you're not too familiar with the concept of environments, you can kind of think of environments as containers that hold your power platform collateral. So you can create a new environment. Uh, for instance, you can actually go to the Power Platform Admin Center and create a new environment. And within inside of that environment, you can uh, create Power Apps, you can create Power Automate solutions, all of that can be done inside of your environment. By the way, one of the things I forgot to mention when I mentioned about the Power Automate trials is you can also sign up for a developer edition. If you sign up for a developer edition of Power Apps, for instance, it also includes Power Automate with it. And you can do anything you want with inside of the developer edition, the developer version of the tool, uh, at no charge. Uh, you, of course, can't use it for production purposes, but it does allow you to explore the full breadth of what you can do with both Power Apps and Power Automate. So the developer edition is a good thing that you can try out. I will warn you, some companies do block you from doing that as well, so be, be aware of that. But in my scenario here, I have created an environment. And again, you can think of an environment as a container where you hold your Power Automate or Power Apps work. So I have a new solution or a new environment here called Power Automate Learn with the Nerds. Uh, I could have a uh, environment that's called Power Automate Learn with the Nerds Development, Power Automate Learn with the Nerds Testing, and Power Automate Learn with the Nerds Production. And so you can have these different environments that you kind of follow your application lifecycle management work where you can have hey, here's where my development work is actually done, but then I can push this into my testing environment for my users to test. Once they approve all of the testing that they've done, I can move it in the, and then into production. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of the game. We're going to talk more about that in the last section of the class because really the proper way to do that and to move your work from one environment to another environment is with a feature called solutions. And we're going to talk more about solutions at, really during like the last few minutes of the class. So we will come back to that concept of moving between environments. The short answer for you on that right now is you're going to do that with solutions, but we'll come back and actually show that in action later in the day. Okay, 
So I am in my fresh environment here that I have and I'm ready to get started. And the first thing that we're gonna be doing in our example is we're gonna explore the template. So I mentioned the templates earlier and how the templates give you a good head start on getting warmed up into Power Automate. And so you can find the template section of Power Automate right here on the left hand side within the navigation. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over to the templates area and explore what kind of templates are available to me that I might want to use. And you can see you're given this big list of templates that are available. But what I'd like to do in this scenario is I'm interested in seeing what kind of automations I can build around uh, maybe something like posting something into Teams. So let's say, for example, I work for a software company that has a support staff that supports our products. And whenever we get an email about a specific product, I want it to email me and let me know that I have a support case that I need to go follow up with. But not only do I want it to email me, I also want it to send me a Teams message. And so what we're gonna do in this scenario is show how I can take an email that I receive and send it to me as a Teams message as well, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go search up in the template section for post message to Microsoft Teams. And I'm gonna go ahead and search here and I find this one a pretty popular one. You can see it has 23,000 people that are using this particular template. I'm gonna select this one called post to Microsoft Teams when an email arrives in Office 365 Outlook. And so I'm gonna go ahead and select this template right here. And when I select this template, it's going to prompt me and ask me, how do I want to uh, wire up my connection information to the template? Because the template is connecting into various data sources. And so if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll actually see towards the bottom here, I'm gonna get off camera here for a moment so you can see this. But towards the bottom, you'll actually see that there's two connectors that are being used here, one to Microsoft Teams and one to Office 365 Outlook. And so I need to confirm which accounts do I want it to use whenever it's connecting into those various connectors. And so I can go ahead and hit sign in and that'll sign in to Microsoft Teams using my account, but I could optionally tell it to use a different account. And then I can also hit sign in into Office 365 Outlook to make sure I'm connected into my proper account for that as well. So this is the experience that you're gonna have whenever you first connect to and select a template that you wanna use. So you can actually select the template and then identify the connectors you're gonna need. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and hit continue. Yeah, this particular one does not require premium. This is a pretty simple uh, template here. No need for premium for this particular one. But let's take a look at what it's done for me here. So it's built with inside of this template. It's going to search my inbox. And you can, by the way, filter to look for certain subject lines, or you can have it filter to look for certain uh, attributes or maybe just emails with attachments, for example. But here's what it does by default. So by default, it's gonna look in my inbox for emails. And whenever I receive at the moment any email, it's going to send me a Teams message. Now you'll also notice it automatically put some conditional logic in here, but at the moment, the conditional logic has nothing that's actually happening with it. There's no, there's no real condition. Actually, it says that the body contains blank. So basically it's saying that there's, there's, there's something there. There's gotta be something in my email here. So the condition's not really doing a whole lot in this particular scenario. But what it's saying here is once I go down, once I receive an email, it's gonna post inside of a Teams channel the body of the email for me. So what we can do is if we wanted to, we can now modify this template that was provided to me. And say, for example, I wanted to look for a particular subject line, I can actually come into the trigger that we have up top. So this is what's considered a trigger right here. My trigger is that I, when I receive an email, that's when it initiates the flow. When I get the trigger of an email arriving, I could also say, hey, I don't want just any email. I want to expand and look at the advanced options here and say, when I get an email with a particular subject line. So when I get an email that says, learn with the nerds, for instance, I'm gonna kick off a, this flow. So not only do I need to get an email in my inbox, but it also needs to have a particular subject line. All right. Then if I want that to be posted somewhere, I can work my way down to where it says that it's gonna post it into a Microsoft Teams channel or chat, and I can determine where it's gonna post this. So if I wanna post it in a particular channel, I can select the channel that I wanted to connect into. That would actually be right here. So I can select the team first. So the team that I wanna use for this example is I have a particular team called Power Automate Learn With The Nerds, it's sorted alphabetically, there it is. And then I can tell it which channel within inside of that team do I wanna post this message. And so I can go into the channel selection here and choose which one of the team's channels that I wanna post this in. 
So I pre-created a Teams channel so we can be able to follow along in this, in, in this particular example. But I just have a team with a channel called Live Event that anytime I get a certain email, it's going to send me the body of the email here. So I get notified. All right. So very simple little template. This is obviously a very beginner level example that we're getting started with. We're going to increase the complexity as we go forward. But I'm going to go ahead and save this by going up to the top right. So you'll see the save button above my head here. And I can hit save to save this flow. Uh, but by default, it is going to save this flow outside of a solution. Again, I mentioned solutions briefly earlier. Solutions are the way to kind of migrate your work from environment to environment. And we're going to talk more about that later. But just keep in mind that whenever you use templates, oftentimes it will create these flows outside of solutions. But you can always add them to solutions later. Again, I'm getting a little ahead of the game. We're going to talk more about that later on. So don't worry too much about solutions yet. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and save my work. And it's saving it to the cloud. It's saving it to my account. And then if I want to test this out, I can hit the little test button in the top right. So in the top right, you'll see the test button above my head here. And when I hit test, it's going to allow me to either choose to do a manual test or an automatic test. If you choose automatic, that's usually going to look at any prior tests that you've done. So if you've done some testing previously, it would actually allow you to run based on a previous execution. But in this case, we're just going to go ahead and do a manual test. All right, so I'll hit test on the bottom. That's actually behind me. Let me get myself off screen here for a moment. So behind me, you'll see there's a test button at the very bottom of our screen. And when I hit test down on the bottom, it's going to get my flow ready to receive an email. And you can actually see there's a message on my screen right now, right here saying, hey, go ahead and send yourself an email if you'd like to test out this flow. All right. So if I want to test this flow out, I will send myself an email. So I had my email purposely closed because I didn't want to be having uh, email messages during the uh, class today. But let me pop it open here for a moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send myself an email with the subject line, learn with the nerds. And as soon as I get that email, it's going to pop in and execute this flow. All right. So let me go ahead and launch this right now. I'm doing this on my other screen, so bear with me for a moment. I don't think you necessarily want to see my email. All right, here is my email I'm about to send to myself. And I'm going to put something in here. So uh, thanks, everyone, for joining the class. And I'm going to hit Send. And assuming my trigger is waiting and accepting that particular subject line that's going to be emailed to myself, anybody can email me that. By the way, you could even do it yourself. I should receive that email, and it should kick off my flow, assuming I made my filter proper uh, with Learn with the Nerds. Hopefully, I did learn with the nerds plural and not learn with the nerds singular. If I did singular, it's not going to pick it up. So let me give it a few seconds here and see if it detects my subject line. And assuming, there it goes. So my flow ran successfully. It kicked off my email. And that actually happened down here. Uh, it actually, sorry, this is not my email. It, it actually received my email and then kicked off a message inside of Teams. Now, if I were to go check my Teams messages, all right, here we go. Inside of my Teams messages, you can see right here, thanks everyone for joining class today. That was received from my email, now posted with inside of the Teams channel. So really cool, very basic example, but it gets you started with understanding how you can do things when you're brand new to Power Automate. Get started by exploring the templates. The templates are a great way to get started. They're a great way to kind of learn, and then you kind of expand beyond those basics once you get going. So we're actually ready to go ahead and move beyond those basics right now ourselves. What we're going to do in our next example is we're going to show you building a flow from scratch. And in, let me set the stage for this next example. I'm going to go ahead and back out of this for a moment. I'll hit the back button right here. That'll take us out of our flow. Uh, one couple things I'll note here is whenever you are looking at a flow that you have executed, you'll actually see in the bottom half here of your screen, once you hit the back button, this will show you the flow executions that you have. So this will show you if you have any flows that are running at the moment right now. By the way, flows can run up to 30 days long. So if you have something that goes 31 days, it's then going to stop on its own. But you can see all of your flow executions that will show down here at the bottom of your screen, and you can actually see previous executions. So if I wanted to look at a previous run of this flow, I can click on the link right here, and it'll actually show me the execution of a flow that happened previously. So if you had, if this flow had run 10 times, you would see a list of 10 different flows here, and you can click on any one of them and actually view what kind of parameters were passed in whenever the flow ran. If it failed, why did it fail? You can go look at it over time and see what was going on. 
The other thing that you'll note is when you look at this particular screen is on the right hand side, this is where you can also determine who are going to be the owners of your flow. Generally, it's a best practice for you not to be the only person that is the owner of the flow because if this flow is particularly business critical and it fails and it errors out and you're on vacation or you're no longer with the company, then what's going to happen, right? So you want to make sure that you do have at least a, one other administrator, someone else that can come in and kind of monitor this. If you're on vacation, they can come in and be able to help out uh, if there were any kind of failure with your flow execution. So keep that in mind. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. That's more on the administration side. We'll talk about that in our last section of our class today. All right, so this was our first flow based off of a template, but I wanna show you how to create a flow now from scratch, from nothing. And the use case that we have for this example is I like to use Microsoft Forms. I'm not sure how many of you like Microsoft Forms. I actually think it's a pretty nice little tool. It has some things that are good about it. It has some things I wish were a little bit better, but, I have a Microsoft form that you're looking at right now on my screen, and it's a registration form for an event. It's actually a registration form, a pretend registration form for today's event. It's not real. But I am using it for our use case today because what I'd like to do is I want to enhance what Microsoft Forms can do. One of the major limitations of Microsoft Forms is that it doesn't actually often send something back to the user that registered on the form. It doesn't send them much information. And what I'd like to do is I actually want to send back to the person that registers a Teams invite, or at the very least, a link to a Teams meeting that's embedded within an email. So what I'd like to do in this use case is anyone that registers for my Microsoft form, I want them to have an email sent back to them that gives them the information about the event, where they need to go whenever the event starts, what to click on, how to get involved within the event that they just registered for. And so my form actually collects a little bit of information down here. I get their first, last name, their job title, and their email address. But what I'd like to do is after I collect this information and they hit submit, I want to immediately send them back a email letting them know that they have, basically giving them all the information for the event. Okay, so we're gonna make this a little bit basic still, but I'm gonna show you how to create a flow from scratch using this example. All right, so I'm gonna leave my form up, but I'm gonna go back to our Power Automate window that I have still open. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new flow from scratch. So if you wanna create a new flow from scratch, there's a couple different places you can go, but we're gonna go ahead and click on My Flows on the left-hand side navigation. So I'll go ahead and click on My Flows on the left. And when you select My Flows, you can see here's the flow that we created a few moments ago from our template. And we'll talk about how to name the flows and rename them later as well. We just kind of went with the template name for that first example. But if I want to create a brand new flow, I can do that by going up to the top where you see the new flow button. Notice here you can also import flows. So you can export and import flows. If I were to select this one, you'll see that you do have an option here to actually export this. And it'll allow you to move it from one location to another. But what I'd like to do in our scenario is I want to create a brand new flow from scratch. So we're going to hit the new flow button and then you're presented with a bunch of different options. So let's talk about the options that you see on the, at least on the bottom here. Uh, the options that you see on the bottom actually have several different uh, things that you can play around with here, several different types of flows. You'll find an automated flow, an instant flow, scheduled flow, desktop flow and business process flow. So let's talk about what each of these five options are here for a few moments. The first one here, the automated flow, this is a flow that is a listener. I like to use that phrase. Basically meaning that an automated flow is gonna have some kind of trigger built in that is listening and waiting for it to be executed. So an automated flow means that you have some kind of trigger. That could be when someone fills out a form. That could be when a new row shows up in your SQL database. That could be when a new row shows up in your SharePoint list. All of those are different types of events that can occur. And when that event occurs, it will execute your flow. So that is an example of an automated flow. All right. An instant flow, the one uh, right below that, is one where you have to manually execute the flow itself. So by manually executing the flow, you would have to have someone that manually pushes a button. You can see even the icon shows you that it's almost like someone's clicking a button here. But you would have to have someone that pushes a button either through their web browser or even through the Power Automate mobile app. So there's actually, I'm pulling it up on my phone right now, there's actually a Power Automate mobile app that you can download and you can kick off and initiate flows from the mobile app. So using the mobile app, you have the ability to initiate and kick off a flow. 
There are even some third parties that sell physical buttons. So you can buy a physical button that someone can push and it will run the flow based on when someone pushes that button. Uh, so that's kind of like the idea, you know, Amazon has uh, that little button that you can push next to your, uh, your washer and dryer whenever you run out of uh, laundry detergent. You can push that button, it'll automatically order you another thing of laundry detergent. That's kind of the same idea with instant flows. You can have someone push a button and it initiates some process. Scheduled flows is probably pretty self-explanatory. So scheduled flows means that a flow runs based on a schedule. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty common sense. And then desktop flows are actually something we're going to cover more in depth in the second half of our class. So I'm not going to go too deep into those. But again, remember, desktop flows are more of those legacy flows, or I should say uh, flows that automate legacy applications is the better way of wording it. So if you have older applications that you want to automate, then you're likely looking at desktop flows. So we'll talk more about that as in the later part of the class. And then finally, business process flows are ones uh, are basically flows that have some kind of human involvement. So think about um, the process of closing a deal for a salesperson. So a salesperson likely starts by doing some prospecting, uh, then they send the customer a quote, then they hopefully get approval from the customer, then maybe there's a step where they get a PO from the customer, a purchase order from the customer, and then finally they close the deal. Well, each of those individual steps that I met, just mentioned can be part of a business process flow or a process flow that says, all right, what process are you with inside of a particular um, a task that you have. So if it's closing business, if it's closing an opportunity for a salesperson, they would have multiple tasks or multiple steps where they can say, and, 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 hum and hu there's human involvement with this, where the human can say, hey, I'm on to the next step in this process kind of thing. So think of a business process flow as there is some manual intervention, but it's on, it's on purpose. It's a human actually saying what step they are with inside of a business process that you have. All right, so for our example though, we're gonna move, move a little faster now. I'm gonna go ahead and select the automated cloud flow that you see right here. And we are gonna create a new flow. We can really call it whatever we want. I'm gonna go ahead and name it up at the top here. And I'm gonna name this, uh, let's say, uh, send Microsoft form uh, registration information. And you can really call it whatever you want. Whatever you name the flow is not super critical. Uh, but then in the next section here, we're going to identify what our trigger is. Again, the trigger is what determines when the flow will actually run. And we're basing off uh, our flow, our process here is to email our customers when they fill out a Microsoft form. So that actually happens to be the very first trigger that you see on the list here, where it says when a new response is submitted. So I'm going to go ahead and select the when a new response is submitted, and I'll select that one and hit create. Now, one thing you should note is you can also just skip all this down here on the bottom. You could hit skip, and that will just take you to a blank design surface where you can build the flow from scratch, and you don't have to name it yet. You don't have to apply what the trigger is going to be. You could optionally hit skip, but I went ahead and selected and gave it a name, and I selected my trigger here. So I'm going to go with that and then hit create. All right. So <clears throat> for this... And uh, for this flow that we're going to do, and by the way, I would share this form with you, but if I did that and everyone started to use this form, then I'm going to start to get uh, dozens of emails that are sent around here. So I won't be sharing the form with you. If you want to use a form, you can most certainly go to Microsoft Forms and create your own. This is just kind of a sample example of what you can do. Normally, I would say, hey, I'll send you the form, but with quite a few people on the line here, we'd have uh, a, lot, a lot of action on my form and a lot of emails going out. But what we're going to do is I'm going to tell Power Automate that which form it is that I want to use and which form it is that I want to connect into. And because I'm signed in using my Office 365 or Microsoft 365 account, I can select the form ID that I have already created. And so I can scroll through and find my Power Automate form. I have a lot of forms that I use, but here's the one that we want to use right here called Power Automate Workshop, December 9th. That's today. So I can select that form that I want to use here. Now, one other little trick, by the way, I'll share with you is if for some reason you have created a form that you don't see listed here. And sometimes, sometimes that can happen if you create forms that are inside of different groups or inside of different containers. You can actually tell Power Automate that you want to use a custom value here, and then you can capture the form ID. The form ID is something that you'll see whenever you are logged in as the admin of the form. So if I was actually logged in as the admin of the form, you'll see in the URL up top, uh, we're not quite seeing it here, but if I was logged in as the admin, you would see a form ID that you can grab and capture and then plug that into Power Automate as well. So for some reason, you were not seeing a form listed here, which I have experienced before myself. You can go grab the form ID, 
Tell it that you want to enter in a custom value and then paste in the form ID. So there is a little workaround if for some reason you don't see your form. But in my case, I actually do see the form here called Power Automate Workshop. So I'm going to go ahead and use that form that we've just selected. And then what I'd like to do is I want to get the details of the person that responded to the form. So keep in mind, the first step that we have here is that we are just kicking off the flow. We are just initiating the flow by the trigger that we have at the very top. So when someone fills out the form, it's going to start the flow. But now in our next step, which we'll select the next step button right here, I want to actually capture the detailed information of what someone typed in whenever they filled out the form. So if we select new step right here, we can then search through all of the Microsoft form. So if you actually just type in form here and search for the Microsoft forms category, we can see that there is a, an action here called get response details. So that's going to give us all of the detail information about the person that filled out the form when the flow was initiated. So I'm going to go ahead and select get response details as the action that we're going to use here. Okay, and let me show this one more time. I know I did that a little fast. How you do this is you can search for the type of thing you're interested in. So if I'm interested in form responses, I can search for forms. And you'll see right here is the same thing, get response details. But you can, if you want, you can go to the category of Microsoft Forms here and then select get response details. All right. So we're going to use the action called get response details. And then we're going to choose the form that they filled out. And one of the neat things about how Power Automate works is you can actually pass values between the different actions and triggers that you have. So if I want to pass in what form the person filled out, I can capture that information from my trigger. So my trigger can actually pass in information from one action to another action to another action if you want. It's called dynamic content, or at least that's how you're going to leverage pulling in values from one action to another action, is using the dynamic content capabilities. So the way that this would work is I can actually choose with inside the unique identifier of the form, I can go through and I can select the form here individually, uh, which I will do in this scenario, or there's actually an area that we'll see underneath the response ID where I can pass in dynamic content. You're seeing that right here. All right, so the form ID that we're going to select is the same form that we had earlier. So I'm going to choose the same form that we did in the previous trigger or the trigger above which was called Power Automate. Let me go down and find it. Power Automate Workshop December 9th. All right, so that's the form that we're trying to use here. But the response that I want to capture is I want to make sure I get the response of the person that initiated the flow. And so what you can do is using the dynamic content capability, which you actually see pops out right here, kind of, kind of pops out on the side, this will allow you to choose, let me take myself off screen for a moment. This will allow you to choose values that have come from other parts of your flow. So if I want to grab something that actually was initiated in a different part of the flow, you can do that using dynamic content. So what I'd like to do is I want to capture the response ID that actually came from the when a new response is submitted. That is the name of my trigger. So you'll notice that the name of the trigger is actually showing up in the dynamic content. And so that's going to allow me to pull back the response ID that initiated the flow itself. OK, so hopefully that makes sense. You can see this matches this. So I'm pulling a column or a field from my trigger and passing it into the next item here, the next action. All right, so we're going to go ahead and select the response ID. We're going to pass in the response ID that was initiated from our trigger and use that with inside of our get response details actions. Now, one of the things that you should probably consider as a best practice is it is common to rename your actions, rename your triggers. You can rename the items with inside of your flows by hitting the three dot menu in the top right of each of these. And you can actually come through and rename these. So if you want to make it really clear on what each of these actions are doing, I do recommend going through and renaming all these. So rename them basically and give them a little bit more context. So get response details from Power Automate Workshop, something like that. And again, the reason why that's a best practice is because if someone has to come in and debug your work, debug your flow, you want them to really know what's going on here. You can also add comments. In the same area where we just renamed your flow or renamed your action, you can also come in and add a note. And if you add a note, this is usually another area where you can provide a little bit more detailed description. Some people also like to put in things like their uh, Power Automate expressions here so they can grab them a little bit easier. But you can come in here and add some kind of little description. So I can put uh, uh, description 
of this action, just to give you an example. And if I click away, you'll notice that that little note appears here for your users. So it's really clear if you give a detailed note on what's going on with inside of this particular action. So just a little tip for you as you get going, it's always good to add in notes by coming over to the three dot menu and then selecting edit note. Renaming is also another best practice here. All right. Cool, so the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna send an email to whoever fills out that form. So to do that, I'm gonna add in a third action or really a th uh, the second action, the first one's a trigger, but I'm gonna add in another item here, another step by hitting the new step button right here. All right, so I'll select new step. And this one is gonna connect into the Outlook connector and we wanna send an email. So I'm gonna search for the action called send an email and if we search for that, we should find an Office 365 connector like you found right here that will, will allow us to actually send an email. And that's what we would like to do for this example. So I'm gonna go ahead and select send an email right here. And you'll notice the new action gets created. Now we have to determine who are we gonna send the email to? This is another area where that dynamic content is gonna come in handy. So if we expand the to section here, if we expand the to section, this is where we can plug in and select the add dynamic content button and say that we wanna send this email to whoever originally filled out our form, which we should be able to get from the get response details action here. So again, we're gonna use dynamic content, grab something from this action and send it into our next action. All right, so if we select add dynamic content, you'll see right here is exactly what we want. There was a question with inside of our, uh, our registration page where we asked our users for their email. And so I can grab the email field and plug that into the two line to allow this to be sent to whoever filled out the form. All right, then for my subject line, I can really put whatever I want in the subject line. So I could say something like, thank you for registering uh, for the Power Automate workshop. Okay, and then you can come in and build out the body of your email. Now to save us a little time, there is a pretty nice little editor here where you can actually bring in some HTML. So if you wanted to, you can even have some HTML pre-written like I have right here. So I have a bunch of pre-written HTML to save us some time. And I can copy and paste that and bring it in using this little button right here where it says code view. If I click on that, that will allow me to either write HTML or copy and paste HTML into the editor or I can also just use the regular port, uh, editor features here to be able to write my own email if I wanted to. But because I've already written a lot of the, the email and I have things like a Microsoft Teams link that I want them to click on, I'm gonna click on the code view button and you'll see that this brings me to an HTML editor that I can paste in my code. And so I can paste in my big long piece of code that I have here and then flip it back using that same button that's now located right here. I can flip that back to the regular view. So take it off HTML view. So if I do that again, and that'll flip it right back to how it was. So I've now included in the email that's gonna be sent to my user some details about the course, but I've also got in here a Teams meeting link that well, they can click on and that will take them to the Teams meeting for this class I have. All right, and you can also see there's some dynamic content that I had in here. You can, uh, you'll can, you notice in some cases it not, might not pick up the dynamic content quite properly when you copy and paste like this. So I could remove that dynamic content and I could re-add it if I wanted it here. So I could actually re-add in the first name of my attendee and make it so that whatever the name was that they provided whenever they filled out the form, I'm gonna address them by their name with the email I send them. So if I would go ahead and select that, you can see the dynamic content plugs in here quite nicely and this is ready to go. So I'm gonna have an email sent to whoever fills out that form with the details of the course, which is something that Microsoft Forms by itself does not really do a great job of, frankly. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and save our work in the top right. And once we save our work, I'm gonna test it out. So I'm gonna hit the test button in the top right here again, way up top here. I'll go ahead and hit test. And we're gonna do a manual test. Meaning I need to have, really I could do either one because I'm gonna have to have somebody go fill out the form for me. I will fill it out myself here in just a moment, but I'm gonna go ahead and do a manual test, hit test, and it's now waiting for someone to submit the form. So you can even see right here, it's telling me the next thing that needs to happen. Someone needs to go submit a response to the form for me to be able to test this out. All right, so if I wanna do that, I'll go back over to my form and I'll put in some information here. I'll put in my name. 
I'll put um, developer, whatever I want. And then this is my actual email. If you want to email me later, you most certainly can. But I'm going to put in my email address here and then hit submit. And then as soon as I hit submit, I am expecting that my form is going to uh, be, uh, actually my, my flow is going to be triggered from the insertion of a new record into Microsoft Form. So if I go ahead and hit submit here, let's go back over to our form or to our flow, I mean. And then I'm expecting that my flow should execute at any point. There it goes. You can see that in the top right hand corner of my screen that the flow ran successfully and the email sent out as well. So if I go look at my email in my inbox, I should see the email that I just sent myself. So this is the email that we just sent. It brought in the dynamic content for the name. It has the nice Teams meeting link in here so my users can click on that and they have all the information they need to go ahead and get started with this course on the, the date that it's supposed to happen. So again, kind of upgrading what Microsoft Forms can do. Microsoft Forms can't really do that by default. It can't embed a Teams meeting link so I can make a flow that does it for me. So pretty cool. All right, hopefully you think it's cool as well. All right, so I think this one is done. We've gotten this flow to run. We can always hit the back button to see the execution of the flow. So if we hit the back button right here, this will take us to a view of the flow. We can see that it actually executed the flow down here on the bottom. It took 28 seconds. It ran successfully. And you can go look and actually, if you want to see that particular execution, just like we showed before, you can click on this hyperlink and that will take you to the same view we were looking at a moment ago that shows you the flow execution. And we'll talk more about kind of debugging flows and how do you deal with error handling and things like that a bit later in our last section. But this is where you can go to see the executions themselves. All right, cool. Let's step up our game some now. So let me give you another scenario. We're still in cloud flows in this next scenario. But in this new scenario, I want to introduce a new potential problem. All right, so at Pragmatic Works, we have a service called Virtual Mentoring. I recommend it. It's quite nice. What virtual mentoring does for our customers is it allows them to come to us with problems that they have and you can buy a bucket of hours and you can meet with one of our trainers and you can share your screen and we can actually work through particular problems that you might have. So check it out if you're interested in virtual mentoring. It's a great service that we have and it helps a lot of people bust through roadblocks that they may be having. But one of the things that we have to worry about at Pragmatic Works is how do we assign those requests when they come in? We have a group of trainers, and some of those trainers are more experts in certain topics versus other topics. And so I want to make it so that whenever a new mentoring request comes in, that it only gets sent to certain people. And I want to set it up so that for me in particular, that I only get requests for Power Automate. I only want to know if there's a Power Automate request that comes in. If it's not for Power Automate, I don't care about it. Get it out of here. I don't want to know about it. But if it's for Power Automate, I want to make sure that sends an email to me so that I'm notified that I need to reach out to this customer, a customer about scheduling some time to meet to solve the Power Automate problem. So the way that we are managing it, at least for this scenario, is through a SharePoint list. I'm sure many of you use SharePoint lists as data sources, and that's great. You can absolutely do that. But what I'd like to do is I want to wire up this SharePoint list to make it so that anytime there's a new mentoring request that comes in, that I get a email sent to me notifying me of that request. If it's something else, I don't care about it. Don't tell me about it. I only care about Power Automate. All right. So the way that this form works is this is just a basic SharePoint list that I have. It's a SharePoint uh, list. And uh, what I can do is if my manager gets a request for a new virtual mentoring session, they would come in and they would select new in the top left. This is again, just a SharePoint list. The one thing I have done to the SharePoint list, I've made a few customizations, like I've made the color here change dynamically. I also have whenever you hit to create a new item in this list, it actually uses a different style form. It uses a Power, uh, Power Apps form instead of the standard form. But if I click new on the right hand side, it's going to pop out this form for me. And in this form, I can enter in the request. So I can say who is the company that's making the request. So uh, let me put in another. Uh, you can see my, my previous customers here are customers that no longer exist. So I'm going to go ahead and type in another customer that no longer, is, no longer exists. We'll call it Blockbuster Video. Yes, I did work there when I was in uh, college. So Blockbuster Video, I can say my customer name was Devin Knight. I can say my customer's email. And I can put what kind of request they had. So if it's Power BI, they can come in and type in Power BI. If it was Power Apps, they can come in and type Power Apps. And when is the session supposed to occur? And then add in a description. So I'm just going to put, this is going to be a garbage record. I'm just going to insert this just so we can see what the process is right now. 
And when I hit save, it's gonna add that record into my list. It also has a little bit of uh, a, an expression on this list to build out the session name here. All right, so this is what happens whenever someone goes to interact with the form, uh, with, with the list, I should say. And so I wanna make it so that I have a flow that captures anytime a new value is inserted into this list, and if it's power automate, I wanna be notified of it. All right, so let's go work our way back over to Power Automate, and we're gonna go back over to My Flows again, over here on the left. So I'll go ahead and select My Flows, and we're gonna create a, another new flow. So I'm gonna come up to the top and select New Automated Flow. And the reason why it's automated this time is because we wanna automatically initiate this flow whenever there is a new row that gets inserted into, or a new item that gets inserted into our list. So if a new item shows up in our SharePoint list, we wanna automatically kick off this flow. So that's why it's an automated one. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and select automated cloud flow. And tell you what, this time, just to be a little different, I'm gonna hit skip on this part. But no, I could come in here, I could name the flow, I can pick out my trigger now if I wanted to. But just to show you a slightly different experience, I'm gonna hit skip on this this time. All right, so I'll hit skip in the bottom. And the first thing that it's gonna ask us for is what is our trigger? It's also waiting for us to provide a name. You'll notice up at the top right now, it has no name. So let's go ahead and name our flow. We'll come up to the top here where it says untitled and we will rename this flow something like, uh, let's say new mentoring request notification. All right. So when we get a new mentor request on our SharePoint list, we wanna be notified. All right, so our trigger in this example is going to be a SharePoint trigger. So we're gonna search for SharePoint. There's also a SharePoint category that we could have selected right here as well. And then you'll see there are all sorts of different SharePoint triggers that you can work with. Now, the one that we want for our example is the one on the very top when a new item is created. You could also alternatively or optionally say when a new item is created or modified. So if you wanted to be notified not only when a uh, list item is created, but also when it's modified, you could select that. But in my scenario, I only wanna be notified when it was initially created. So I'm gonna select the very top, top, top option here called when an item is created. That'll be our trigger. And then we're going to specify what SharePoint site we are trying to use. So where is the SharePoint site that we're trying to connect to to pull back? And by the way, this is uh, SharePoint Online. This is a cloud version of SharePoint. But we're gonna go ahead and say that we wanna uh, look at the site called Training, which I have right here called Training 46. So I'm gonna pull from my Training 46 site, and we're gonna go ahead and select the list name from that SharePoint site. So first you have to tell it the site name, then we're gonna tell it the list that we wanna pull back from. So the list that I wanna use in this scenario, and by the way, I have a lot of lists that you can see here. The list that I wanna use in this example is called mentoring request. All right, now <clears throat> I am actually first gonna show you this using a not best practice. And so if, you, if you're maybe familiar with the, one of the bad practices I'm about to show you, hang tight, I will show you the better way of doing this in a few moments. But I'm gonna show you kind of the, the, the not as ideal way of doing this first, and then I'm gonna circle around and show you the best practice as far as how to do this. Because essentially what we wanna do is we wanna filter the results, so that way anytime someone goes to fill out the form, we check what kind of request it is. We wanna look at this column right here and know what type of request is being made. Is it Power Automate, is it Power BI? Now there's a couple different ways that we can, it could be Power Apps as well, I think somebody could request that. There's a couple different ways you can handle this. And I wanna start by showing you uh, using conditional logic, uh, because one, I wanna introduce you to the concept of conditional logic, but then I'm gonna show you that's not necessarily the best practice and the way that we should do this. But I wanna introduce the concept of conditional logic because I think it will be helpful for other things that you might do, but then we're gonna improve on this after we show you conditional logic. We're gonna make it better. All right, so first things first, let's go back over to our flow and we are going to add in a condition. Now a condition is a way of splitting up your logic. It's a way of splitting up the flow execution and it's going to have to, your, your flow execution is gonna to have to meet some requirement that you check it for, that you have it checked for. So we're gonna go ahead and add in another new step right here. So we'll hit new step. 
and we're going to search for a conditional function or a conditional action, which you should see on your screen already. It's right here. It's the fun, well, the, really the default one because it's used so frequently. It's the one you'll find here first. So we're going to go ahead and select condition. And I'm going to take myself off camera here. There we go. And what we want to do is in the condition, which is right here, we want to make a certain request. We want to make a certain filter check. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into where it says choose a value, and we're going to have it search for some dynamic content. So when you select choose a value, you'll see the dynamic content box pops out right here. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to search for a particular column. The column that we are interested in is called request or requested topic. So we're going to search for the requested topic column or field. And when that requested topic value is equal to Power Automate, and by the way, you can say is equal to, you can say contains, is greater than or equal to, uh, does not contain. There's a lot of different things you can do in this. But we're going to say when the requested topic is equal to Power Automate, then if that's evaluated to true, it's going to go down the left path. If it's evaluated as false, it's going to go down the right path. Now, if it's false, I don't really want to do anything with it. Uh, because this is just for me, so I'm going to leave it alone, and I'm not going to do anything if it evaluates to false. But if it's true, I want to send myself an email or maybe a Teams message notifying me of the request. So we're going to come down to the box here that says if yes, right here, and we're going to add an action with inside of that box. All right, so we'll go ahead and select add an action. And the type of action that we're interested in here is going to be an e email action, just like our last example. So we're going to type in send an email, and we're going to use the send an email version 2 action found right here. Okay? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and select that as well underneath send an email. There we go. And that chooses the send an email action, and we can do something similar to what we did before. Now, because I've created this flow just for me, I don't really have a dynamic two line. I'm just going to plug in my own email address here. There we go. I'm going to put in some kind of subject line so I can say this is a Power Automate Mentor session. And then if I want to make some dynamic content in here, I could actually go look at, uh, let's see, let's look at our, our, our list here for a moment. If I go back over to our list, maybe I want the session name to show up in the subject line of my email. So I can grab this right here as dynamic content that I want to bring into my email. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to go back over here and we'll say uh, the email subject line is going to be Power Automate Mentor Session. And then we're going to put the session name in there as well. All right. Then we can come down a little lower. And in the body of our email, we can start to make some dynamic content in here as well. So maybe I say something like who the customer was. Uh, we can also put in their email address. Maybe we want to see a description of the problem they're trying to solve. And then I'm putting little labels in here, but now I can actually add in the dynamic co content of who the customer's, uh, what the customer's name was, so I can get their name right here. And again, I'm bringing this from the dynamic content you see over here on the right. I can bring in their email address, so I can grab the customer email. And I can also grab the description. These are all fields that came from our trigger. So I'm using the items that came from here, and I'm now injecting them down in the latter parts of our flow. All right. All right, cool. So now that I have that, this is looking pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and save our flow. So I'll go to the top right and hit save right here. All right. And then we're going to test this out. So I'll hit the test button in the top right. Really, I don't even have to test it. If I just go to insert another value, it'll work. But I kind of like using the test option because it will tell me if I did this as a test rather than as a actual execution. So I'm going to go ahead and hit test in the top right. Tell it I want to do a manual test again, and then hit test in the bottom. Okay, let me show you that one more time. We've done this a couple times now, so I'm doing it a little faster. We're going to come to the top right and hit test, hit manually, and then hit test on the bottom. All right, so now when I do this, it is waiting for me to insert a new value into SharePoint. So it's monitoring SharePoint. It's listening to SharePoint, waiting for a new value to show up there. So I would need to go back over to my SharePoint list if I want to test this out and insert an actual new value. All right, let's see what other fake company name or maybe uh, other retired company name I can come up with here. I'm going to go ahead and do another new record. And this time, I'm going to go ahead and plug in. We'll say the company name is, let's go with Enron. We're going to pick a really dated company name here. 
Uh, we'll say that the uh, customer's name is Jacob. I'm just making something up here. I want to make sure I get the email, so I'm going to plug in my email address here. Actually, I should get the email regardless. So we're going to say uh, Jacob at Enron.com. And then the subject matter is Power Automate. The date, I can put a future date in here if I wanted to. I'll just leave the default. And then I can add a description. I can say um, needs help with Power Automate desktop. Close. All right, then if I hit save, it's gonna load that record in the list. And you can see my flow is already running. It didn't wait very long at all. My flow is executed and already completed and sent myself an email. And if I go check my inbox, here's what we just got sent. I got sent an email with the subject line that had some dynamic content in it with the session name. It has the customer's name, their email, and the description of the session. So now I know I need to go re reach back out to Jacob. I probably should have put the date in here as well. Actually, the date's right here. But now I can reach out to Jacob and say, hey, unfortunately, your company doesn't exist anymore. I'm not sure we can help you anymore. So we can kind of play around with it like that. All right, so that's how you can build out a flow off of a SharePoint list. So pretty cool stuff there. Now, if we wanted to, and we want to validate that, hey, this is working, even if we put in something that does not say Power Automate, we could do that as well. We could actually insert another value into our list that is not Power Automate, and we would expect that our flow would run. So let's actually, let's check this out. Let's do this one more time. Let's test this again. All right, we're going to test this one more time. But this time, I'm going to insert a value that is not Power Automate. So I'm going to come back into my list. And I'm going to go ahead and say that this one is uh, Toys R Us. They sort, they don't. I don't think they exist anymore. Uh, we'll say that um, Jeff is the person I'm trying to email, or Jeff is the person that wants mentoring. Uh, we'll say at ToysRUs.com. They're requesting uh, some help with Power Apps, and the date is fine, and we can put in any description we want because we're not going to get emailed this. And so if I hit save this time. You can see the Power Apps entry gets put in. You'll see my flow runs again. However, the flow goes down this path. So because it did not evaluate to Power App, Power Automate, excuse me, because the condition was not met, it never went down the, the left path. It went down the right path instead. You can see this item right here, it's even kind of indicating to you was never run. And so instead of running down the yes path, it went down the right path of no and nothing happened. All right, so I told you early on that I was gonna show you this example, but I kind of even told you in advance that this is not necessarily the best practice or the best way to do this. Really, the better way to do this is to use something called um, uh, tr a trigger condition. So you can actually build conditions on your triggers to make sure that the triggers never even execute unless that condition is met. So let's, I'm gonna go ahead and edit this flow again. And ideally, what I'd like to do is I want to get rid of this condition because right now what's happening is no matter what someone enters into that list, that SharePoint list, my flow runs every time. Every time my flow runs, it just determ my, my condition just determines whether or not I get emailed or not. The better practice here would be to implement something called trigger conditions. And what trigger conditions would do is it would apply the same filter that we're doing right now at the, at the condition level, but on the trigger. And the benefit of that happening is it would mean that your flow would never run to begin with if that condition is not met. And the reason why that's helpful to you is because uh, Power Automate does work on uh, a number of executions that you have. So if you're unnecessarily executing your Power Automate flows, it could eat up a little bit of your licensing. We're not going to get super deep into licensing today. But if I can save myself those executions and uh, prevent this flow from even running if the condition's not met, that's a good thing. So what we want to do in this example is we're actually going to get rid of some of the work that we've done thus far. We're going to replace some of what we have on our screen already. We're going to get rid of the condition. We're going to get rid of this little if then else thing we have going on. And we're going to move our send email action. We're going to grab this and we're going to move it up here. You can move these things around if you wanted to. So I can grab this and I can move it up here. Okay. So if I wanted to, I can shift that out of the condition and I can delete the condition by going over to the, let me take myself off screen here. We can delete the condition by going to where it says menu for condition and we can go ahead and delete it here if we want to get rid of it because we're going to replace this condition filter in a different way. 
So I'm going to go ahead and delete it. Yep, get rid of it. And so that leaves us just with these two steps that we have now. So what we want to do is ultimately, we want to change our trigger. And in the trigger itself, we're going to come into the menu for the trigger and we're going to modify the settings. Now we're not quite ready to do this yet because we actually need to write a little bit of a power automate expression to make this work. But in the settings area, what we're going to modify is we're gonna add in a trigger condition, which basically determines whether or not the, the, the trigger itself will fire off. So we wanna prevent the trigger from, or in really the flow from even firing off if our condition's not met. Okay. So how do we do that? How do we get the expression to plug in here? Because we need to actually plug in a Power Automate expression to make this work. Now there's a lot of different ways to write expressions, but if you're not super familiar with how to write expressions, one of the ways that I tend to do, uh, especially if I wanna plug them into a trigger condition, is I will use a action called a compose action. So real quickly, what a compose action is going to do for you is it's basically kind of like a placeholder. It doesn't have to really do anything, but what the compose action is going to allow us to do is write this expression. And we're going to use it as kind of this blank workplace so that we can write our expression and then we can copy and paste that expression into our trigger. Okay, so we're going to add an action called compose. And then at the end, we're going to go ahead and get rid of it. But basically, I need the ability to write out a little expression. I could technically do it in the send email action there, but I want to show you a different way of doing it. So we're going to go ahead and add in another new action. We can either do it at the top or the bottom, a new, new step, I should say. And so I'll add in and insert a new step. And we're going to add in a new action right here. And the type of action that we're going to use is the one I mentioned just a moment ago called compose. So I'm going to type in compose. And again, think of Compose as just a little playground where you can write expressions, you can keep the output of the expressions, you can delete the output of the expressions, you can do whatever you want with them. But in this case, we're going to use it as a little, a little bit of an expression editor for us, and then we're going to get rid of it. All right, so we're going to go ahead and select the Compose action that you see right here. So I'll go ahead and select that. And then inside the Compose action, we are going to write some dynamic content. So inside of the dynamic content section, we're gonna add an expression. So where you see the expression section right here, this is gonna be our first introduction into Power Automate Expressions. It has its own expression language, but we're gonna expand the expression section. And what we're gonna be looking for is an expression that will allow us to evaluate whether or not the requested topic column is equ equivalent to Power Automate. So this expression language is a little funky. It's a little different than maybe things that you might've seen in the past. So kind of, I'm going to take myself off screen so you can see it, um, but just kind of pay close attention. What you'll find is that there is a good document library for Power Automate Expressions. In fact, I'm going to share this with my colleague who is on the uh, call with us here that's actually sharing information so he can put it in the uh, chat for you. But he's going to share with you a link to a reference guide for the formula language for Power Automate. So take a peek at that. Save it into your uh, resources for later, but for the purposes of our quick little demonstration here, we're going to be using an expression that evaluates something to be equal to a value. So there's actually a function in here called equals. Let me zoom in on this for you. So there's an expression in language or a, a, a function, excuse me, called equals. And you can see that there's some IntelliSense here that's trying to help us out a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and plug in equals here. And then I'm going to do an open parentheses. And what I'd like to do is I want to pass in a column or a field to evaluate whether or not it is equal to a certain value. Now, the, the way that this works is you can kind of hop back and forth between the expression tab and the dynamics content tab or the dynamic content tab. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the dynamic content tab for a moment and we want to check and see whether or not the requested topic column, which we'll scroll down and find way down. There it is. We're going to plug in the requested topic column into our equals function that we're seeing above. So we'll plug that in right here. And the reason why we did it this way is because look at all this other stuff that gets added for us. So it's kind of difficult. Like I, w I do not have all that stuff memorized. So and I don't expect you to memorize all this stuff that gets plugged in here as well. But whenever you select dynamic content in a particular column, you're going to get some extra information or some extra details that come along for the ride. 
And so rather than you trying to memorize all of that information, this is basically telling you that it's coming from our trigger. It's an output from our trigger. But rather than you memorizing it, you can use the dynamic content section here to leverage it. Now, the end of this, at the tail end of this expression, you can actually tell it with a comma, you're going to tell it what is the value that you're looking for. So we are looking for the value of power automate. All right, and I'm going to actually provide this to uh, Jonathan, my colleague, who's in the class with us here. I'm going to provide that link to or that uh, expression so he can put that in the chat for you. But essentially what this does is it's checking to see if the requested topic column is equal to Power Automate. And you'll notice that I have the single quotes around the Power Automate column because it is a string column or a text column. We need the single quotes around it here. Okay. So with that, I'm going to copy this expression that I just wrote and then I can get rid of the compose expression. Uh, the compose action. The really only the reason I needed this compose action is so that I could pop up this expression box and write that little expression here. One little tip for you, and uh, you don't necessarily have to do this, but one little tip that you might want to take advantage of is if you are if you like living on the edge, if you like exploring new features, there is a much better editor than the one that we just saw here. Uh, the better editor that is in at the moment in preview in experiment mode in experimental mode is there is an option that you can turn on in a different editor and I'm not going to actually do it right now but I'm going to show you where you could do it because if I if I were to do it I would lose all my work here but if I go to hit the little uh, settings cog right here in the top right way up here oh I really I did a really bad job of boxing that off there we go right there if I were to hit that settings button up in the top right you'll see underneath the view all power automate settings don't actually do this because I'm not going to do it but if you turn on the experimental features there is a much better better expression editor that's available to you it's actually the same expression editor that you have whenever you use another tool that's similar to power automate called logic apps that is the uh, more enterprise version of this tool it's part of Azure uh, but if you turn on that little cog that, or the little on-off switch that you see on the screen right now, again, don't do it right now. Do that on a little test environment later on. But that has a much better expression editor that's a lot easier to work with. So just a heads up on that. I'm not going to do that, but I want to point you in that area in case you are interested in that. Uh, it's a better, it's a way better editor, frankly. All right. So our compose action that we have right here, remember I told you that was temporary. We only wanted this so that we could extract out that expression that we wrote earlier. And I've already copied and copied that expression, so I'm ready to take that expression now into my trigger. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this action. And I'm going to go back into the settings of my trigger. So if I go into the settings of my trigger right here, okay, if I go click on the settings found right here, I can apply a trigger condition, which means my flow will not even run unless the condition is met. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do a setting, or go into the settings. We're going to come down to where it says trigger phrases, or trigger, trigger conditions, to my left here, to my side. And I'm going to go ahead and select that we want to add in a trigger condition. All right, now for this trigger condition, I'm going to paste in the expression that we copied a few moments ago. But the one trick to this to make it work is you need to prefix your expression with an at sign. So I'm going to need to, need to go to the very front of this and add in an at sign here. Jonathan, if you could post that in there in the chat one more time, the same expression just with an at sign in front of it. That at sign is how you have to identify conditions that you're trying to equate with inside of your triggers. So keep that in mind. You need the little at sign in front of the expression that we created and generated earlier. But once we do that, I can hit done. And now we're all set. You can see we've eliminated a lot of the work here. We don't have things that we had previously. We don't have a condition uh, in here anymore. That condition was kind of unnecessary. We have now replaced that and made this a lot easier to work with. So I can hit save. And now whenever I go to run this or test this flow, so we can go ahead and test it again. You guys have seen how to test it a number of times now. So I did the test a little faster this time. But I have this now set in testing mode. So if I were to go insert another value into our SharePoint list, if it does not meet the condition, my flow is never going to run. It's only going to run if I were to put in Power Automate as the requested topic. So just to test that out, I'm going to go ahead and add in a new request. And we'll say that this, uh, this one is going to come from, let me give you another old company name here. 
we'll go with uh, compact, compact. All right, and then my user is going to be Sandra, and we'll say Sandra at compact.com. All right, the requested topic for Sandra is going to be Power BI, which means my flow should not run. And then my description can be whatever. I'm going to leave that alone and then go ahead and hit save. So I'm expecting my flow will not run. Now, remember, these flows ran pretty quickly. So I should see if it were to run, it would run right, right away. But we're not seeing anything happen right now. So that's a good thing. So my flow never even ran because my trigger condition was never met. But if I were to add in another request, let's make this one Pragmatic Works, hopefully not a company that's going anywhere. Uh, the username will be Devin. The email will be myself. And we'll make the request topic Power Automate. Spell it right. And then we'll give it some kind of description. OK. Then when I hit Save on this, it should run the flow right away. So we'll give it a moment or two here. There it goes. And then I should have received an email with that request. So the whole purpose of that demo, and I can pop open the email that it sent me here. Let me bring that up here for a moment. Just got it. Here it is. Here's that request. But the whole purpose of this demo is really to highlight some better efficiencies that you can make with inside of your flows. So rather than using conditions to try and filter down the results, try and use trigger conditions to be able to filter your results. And you can do equals like I did. You can do greater than. You can do less than. There's a lot of different types of condition statements that you can implement. I just happen to do an equals uh, to value in this, in this case. All right. Well, cool. We are at a point. I want to go ahead and give you a break. You've been listening to me for almost an hour and a half now. Let's take a 10-minute break. And then when we come back, we're going to continue on. And I have uh, one more Cloudflow demonstration. And then we're going to move to desktop flows. All right. So I'm going to put a 10-minute timer on my screen. I'll see everybody back here and get started back. And then, again, I want to thank everyone for joining. I know it's a uh, oh, I'm kind of blurry. Let me see if I can fix that. Whoop. Sometimes having to refocus the camera might fix it. Oh, I'm still so blurry. That's a bummer. Let me, sorry, one more time. Sometimes it has to refocus. Oh, it's a little better, still blurry. All right, that's okay. So, uh, oh, there we go, now I'm better. All right, so I wanna thank everyone again for joining. If you're just joining back in halfway through today's course, uh, appreciate it. You can, as a reminder, this class is recorded. You can go back and watch parts that maybe you missed earlier. If you're just jumping in live, this is recorded. You can go back and scroll back, watch me do things multiple times if you'd like. Absolutely no problem doing that. Uh, I also want to take a, just a moment. Obviously, this course is free today. We like to kind of share a little bit about what we do at Pragmatic Works in case maybe perhaps we might be able to help you in the future. As I mentioned, Pragmatic Works is solely a training company. All we do is training. That is our sole focus. And we do training in a lot of different ways. We have recorded training through our on-demand system. Our on-demand learning portal has 70 different courses, which range from courses on the Power Platform, like Power Automate and Power Apps and Power BI, as well as Azure and SQL Server. Uh, we also have uh, live talk classes. So if you prefer to have live training, we do live training through our boot camps. Our boot camps can be either taught uh, just privately to your organization, or we also have public boot camps that can be found on our website. We actually happen to be running a Power Platform Bootcamp this week. Actually, today's the last day of the Power Platform Bootcamp that we're running, but we'll have another one coming up next year. So if you like to have kind of a class that's hands-on, that is uh, um, a small class, uh, we usually keep those and limit those to about 15 people to make sure that it's not overwhelming and everyone can interact, check out our boot camps on our website. We also have another offering called Hackathons, and Hackathons are a really neat combination of education but also applying what you learned. So what hackathons allow you to do is we always start with a hackathon with at least a one-day training class. So we want to teach you some of the basics of a technology, whether it be Power Apps or Power Automate or Power BI or even Azure. We start with a one-day class on the topic that our, we're, we're hoping to build a hackathon around. But we, after we get done with that one-day, let's say, Power Automate class, the next day is then focused on actually building a Power Automate solution with your ecosystem, with your environment, with your use case, more, most importantly. And so the goal with that is to take some of the things that you learned in the training class and actually apply it to your 
life, to your data. Uh, because there's nothing worse than, worse than attending a training class, right? And, you, and everything work, works hopefully perfectly in the training class, but then you go back to your desk to try and take some of the things that you learned and apply it to your solutions, and it just doesn't work because things are different. Well, that's where a hackathon kind of solves that problem where we can actually build something with you. We also have uh, larger packages for people that have not just hundreds, but even thousands of people to train. So if you have a lot of people to train, we have some custom options around our customized enterprise training, which is designed not only to tra train a few dozen people, but even hundreds or even thousands of people. So we have some, uh, some, some good case studies on our site, some video interviews where we've done with people where we have done this work with them before, where they had thousands of people they needed to train, we have good programs to kind of manage that because not everybody learns the same. Some people can learn with recorded training, some people prefer to have a live instructor, and we have packages that kind of help everybody. And then finally, I mentioned this offering a little bit earlier, is our mentoring service. And our mentoring service allows you to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our experts, and you can share your screen with them and show them a specific problem that you're trying to have, or that you do have. And so the way that this works is you buy a bucket of hours and you can use the bucket of hours in, in, in little as 30 minutes of it at a time or at maximum two hours a day. And so that allows you to kind of set time aside and solve a specific problem that you have with an expert on the technology and they can get you bust through any, any of those roadblocks that you might be having. Now, all of these are great offerings, but I will tell you, we happen to have a special on the on-demand learning right now on our site. If you go to pragmaticworks.com, you'll find in the banner that there's actually a half-off price uh, that's going on for our on-demand learning. So check that out on our website. I definitely encourage that. That's a great way to learn, especially if you like self-paced training so you can watch whenever you have free time. Take a peek at that on our homepage of our website at pragmaticworks.com. You'll find where you can sign up for our on-demand learning. That's 12 months. It's a year subscription at half off. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your patience through that. Another reminder as well, if you're just joining us, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also hit the bell for notifications to make sure you're notified when we do additional videos like this or even other types of videos that we do in the future. All right, so our plan to move forward here is we have two major topics that we're gonna do going forward. And I saw a lot of excitement for approvals in the chat. So I wanna make sure we cover approvals before we wrap up our day. In fact, that's gonna be the next topic that we cover is how to build approvals. And we're gonna do that in the context of the example that we've already been walking through. Uh, our example of using a SharePoint list as a data source, we're gonna add approvals into that uh, particular example. And so what I'd like to do is take the flow that we've already designed that has a SharePoint list as a source, and I wanna set up and define an approval. Now, for some of you that might not be familiar with what approvals are, here's a basic definition of approvals. Approvals allow you to inject human interaction into your automations. So that's, a, that's kind of a high level definition of what approvals can do. Is what you're trying to do with an approval is you're trying to make sure before some action occurs, that a human approves or rejects it happening. So for instance, looking back at the flow that we've created so far, maybe I wanna make the flow that we've designed so far have an approval right here where someone says yes or no to whether or not I wanna send that email to my user, okay? So before this email gets sent, I wanna inject an approval here that says yes, it's okay to send that or no, it's not. So high level, Think of approvals as injecting human interaction into your automations. That's the basic definition of them. And what we're gonna see next is how we can do that. All right, so we're gonna follow along with this flow that we've already designed so far, so that way we don't have to design something else from scratch. And I'm gonna go ahead and edit this flow in the top right. I'll click the edit button. And what I'd like to do is I really do wanna do what we suggested a moment ago, is I wanna inject in the middle of our flow a new action, and this will be an approval action. And then we're gonna talk about the different kinds of approvals you can do and the different types of ways you can initiate an approval as well. So we're gonna go ahead and say we wanna insert a new step in the middle right there. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and select to add in a new step and we're gonna add in a new action right here. Now we're gonna say, and, and the approvals are a pretty common feature. So you'll actually see approvals once you start to type them in will pop in here really quickly. So if you type in approve or even approval, you'll see approvals will pop up right here. But what you will notice is there are three different types of approvals that are showing up here for us. So let's talk about these here for just a moment. You'll see these three approval types. You have wait, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you have start and wait for an approval. You have create an approval and you have wait for an approval. 
Now what start and wait for an approval will do is it will begin the process of having that human interaction and it's gonna sit there and wait until the human says yes or no. Yes, I approve it or no, I reject it. So the way that the approval will work is by default, it's gonna run and wait for someone to interact with it. What create an approval will do is it will create the approval, the approval will start, but the flow will continue until you follow it up with some kind of a wait. So you can actually split up the first one. So the idea of the second two is essentially splitting up this and this apart from each other. So it's making it so that you can start an approval but not actually wait for the approval to complete somewhere later on down the line. So you have the ability to kind of control that behavior. So that's what these three different options do. Start and wait, just start, or wait for a later time. Okay, so you can split those different actions up. Now for the example that we're gonna do in our scenario, we're gonna follow the, the start and wait for an approval action, which again, that's gonna start our approval, start injecting our human interaction, and then wait for the human to actually do something. So that's the method that we're gonna use for our example. So we're gonna go ahead and select that we want to start and wait for an approval. All right, so I'm gonna select that option. You can see that the approval is then injected in the middle of our flow. And then what we wanna do is we're gonna select the approval type. So if we look a little carefully here and look a little closely at the approval types, you'll see there are four different options that are available to you. So let's talk briefly about these different options that we have. You have approve slash reject everyone. Uh, so everyone must approve. You have the first person to approve. So let's talk about these two first before I move on. Uh, so approve or reject, everyone must approve. What that means is you can send the approval to multiple people. So maybe you send it to five different people. And if you have it set to everyone must approve, then that means all five people have to give you the thumbs up before the approval will move on. If you select first to approve or first to respond, that means of the five people, whoever the first one to respond to it is will allow the approval to move forward. Okay, so this one means all five people have to accept it. This one means just one of the five have to accept it. And then you could also do some different custom messages in here if you wanted to, or some custom responses. We're not gonna get too deep into that, but these standard ones are really the most common ones that you'll do anyways. But what we're gonna do for ours is we're gonna select that we want to approve slash reject based on the first to respond. That's the second option right here, okay? Then you're gonna give your approval a title. So this is basically what's gonna show up in the approval whenever it is either going to appear in Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams actually has an approval section now. Many of you are probably already familiar with that. It'll also send your approvals to your inbox, to your email. But whatever the, the title is here is what it's going to appear whenever it's sent to you in either Teams or Outlook. And so we're gonna make our approval here and we're gonna call this something like uh, learn with the nerds approval and if we wanted to, we could even put something like the session name in it. So I can grab some dynamic content and I can inject that dynamic content into the title if I wanted to. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. There you go. All right, then you have to determine who do you wanna send the approval to. Now I got a little bit of bad news for you when it comes to the assigned to. In the assigned to section, you do have to do individual email addresses. This unfortunately does not tap into Azure Active Directory and it's not able to grab groups there, which is kind of a kind of a big bummer. At least that's how it works right now as the, mom as the moment of us doing the session. This does not accept Active Directory groups. However, you, what you would do instead is you would have to plug in individual emails of those that you want to receive your approval. So if I want Devin to receive it, if I want Jonathan, my other colleague who's on the line with us to receive it, I can put in each of those individuals that I want to receive the approval, okay? Yep, and unfortunately, kind of a bummer, I can't just provide a group of users, I have to provide them individually. That's kind of a downside of it at the moment. All right, then if I wanna come down a little bit more, I can provide some details. So what kind of details do I wanna embed in the approval itself? This is where you likely would leverage some of your dynamic content, there's also a markdown language that if you follow this link right here, you can find what kind of other things you can do in there, like how you can format it where you can have bullet points, how you can have a numbered list. There are different things you can do within the approval, the details of it. If you go to that a markdown language site, you can kind of see what the different uh, ways are that you can format the details that are returned back. But in our use case here, what I wanna do is I'm gonna put in something like, uh, please approve or reject the following mentor request. 
And then if I wanted to, I can come in and say, all right, well, uh, what we want to plug in here is the session name. Oops, let's type that right, session name. And I can put in the session name for my dynamic content. I'm going to zoom out for a moment so you can see the full context of my screen here. But I can grab the session name for my dynamic content. I can maybe plug in something like the description. And I can bring that in here as well. So this is all coming from my dynamic content, same as we did in our previous example. And then I can bring in something like, maybe I want to have a link to the actual item. So you can actually put in right here in a link to where it can be found. So there is a link right here in the dynamic content, a link to the SharePoint list. So if I put the link to item, I can put that into my dynamic content here if I wanted to, and it will give my users a link they can actually click on if they want to go see more details of the uh, of the, 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 the details of the request here. And I might also want to put like the date in here. So there's a lot of other things I can go in detail on here, but I'm going to go ahead and leave it as that. I'll put the date in here. We'll, we'll wrap that up, but that's my, my approval that I want to send my users. All right, so that's really the basics of it, but what do I do with the outcome of the approval? So now that I've created this approval, what do I do next? The next thing that I want to do is I want to actually determine, well, if, if it's rejected, do I want to send the email? Or if it's approved, do I want to send the email? And by default, the way it's going to work right now is I don't have anything that basically blocks whether or not to continue on with the flow. I want to add in something, actually something that you've already seen, a condition right here is where I want to inject a condition. And in that condition, I'd like to add in the ability to check whether or not the approval outcome was set to approve. If it was set to reject, then I don't want to do anything with it. But if it was set to approve, then I want to go ahead and email the user to notify them of the request. All right, so if I want to do that, if I want to set up a condition in here, this is going to follow a similar pattern to what we did in our previous example, actually like two examples ago. We're going to add in another action right here, and that action is going to be a condition. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Add in action and we're going to do a condition condition is found right in front of us right here so I'm gonna go ahead and select the condition once we select the condition you're gonna see that same split that we saw in our last example so you have your condition up at the top if the condition is met it's gonna go left if the condition is not met it's gonna to go to the right and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sell tell it with inside of the condition that we want to look for the outcome you'll find the outcome right here we want to look for the outcome of the approval. And if the approval was set to approve, then we want to send ourselves the email. If it was set to reject, then we don't want to send the email. So we're going to go ahead and select in the choose a value section, the dynamic content that's right here for the outcome. All right, so we're going to select outcome. And if the outcome is equal to approve, Make sure you type approve and not approved. You, you have to make sure you do it uh, with just an E on the end. Don't do a D. If you do it with a D, it's not going to work. Uh, same with uh, uh, the, the opposite. So you want to make sure you say approve or reject here. But then once you type in that you want to look for approve status of an outcome, then if it is approved, it'll go down the left path. If it's not approved, it's going to go down the right path. And that's where we can grab our send an email action and drop it into whichever area we want it to be in. So if I want the send an email action to be on the approve side, then I would go ahead and bring it into the if yes section here. Okay? And that's a pretty basic approval, but let's see it in action. If I go ahead and hit save, okay, so that's going to save our approval. You can see it says it's saving up top, and now it's done saving. Now we can test it out. So we'll go ahead and hit test. We're going to do a manual test again. All right, so now it's waiting for us to trigger off our flow, which is going to be based on us inserting a new value into our SharePoint list. So I'm going to go back over to my SharePoint list here, and we're going to insert another value. This time, we're going to make this the company of, we'll do, um, I don't know. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up with companies that don't exist, uh, let's do, that don't exist anymore. Uh, let's do, do like Sears Robot. We'll do Sears. Sears is still around. I feel bad for you. I think they're sort of still around. Uh, we'll say uh, from Sears, it's going to be Judith. Oop, let's spell Judith's name right. And it's Judith at Sears.com. All right, and she is interested, Judith is interested in learning about or having a mentoring session around Power Automate. So we'll type in Power Automate here. 
And then we could add in the description. We can say something like, uh, I am interested in learning about approvals. All right. Then when I hit save, that's going to add the row to my SharePoint list. So I'll go ahead and do that. And it should uh, kick off my flow. All right, so let's watch it. It should kick off my flow any moment now. Remember, we used the Power Automate filter criteria, so it should run just fine. And it's started and stopped in approval. Now, approvals are likely going to be sent to you in one of two ways. I mentioned this earlier. They're likely going to be sent to you in Microsoft Teams, but they will also be sent to you through your inbox. So if I go look in my Microsoft Teams section, I can see through my approvals app that I have an approval sitting here waiting for me. Actually, that's not the right one. Here it is. Here's the approval popping up here. So this is the approval section within inside of Microsoft Teams. It's actually, I'm looking in my activity feed, and here's the approval that we sent ourselves. Learn with the nerds approval, Sears at Judith for today. Here's the request. You can see the approval app actually popped up here in the bottom now. And I even have a link so I can go back to the SharePoint list and look at it if I wanted to. So it's waiting for me to choose whether or not I want to approve or reject this approval so I can choose which route I want to go. By the way, you'll notice here that it's got sent to both Jonathan and Devin, so you can see that here. And you'll also be able to find the same approval showing up in my inbox as well. Now it looks like someone approved this. Jonathan, I'm going to assume you, you might have hit the approve button here because I see the approved status went through. So I'm going to assume Jonathan did it. In fact, actually, yes, I have documentation. Jonathan's trying to sabotage me here. I'm just kidding, Jonathan, you're fine. Uh, but Jonathan actually approved this just a moment ago. And so once it got approved, if I went back to look at my flow, you can see my flow completed. And remember, my flow ends by sending me an email, so I should have received this email as well. So if I go look in my inbox, sure enough, here's my email from my mentoring application, my mentoring list telling me about Judith's uh, request for a mentoring session about approvals. So using and leveraging approvals allowed me to kind of have a little bit of a gatekeeper here. So I added in and, and kind of had a, a gatekeeper to determine whether or not I wanted to actually have this flow to continue to go forward. Ooh, I'm blurry again, I'm seeing here. I'm gonna take myself off camera if it's gonna be blurry. So uh, that allows me to kind of have more control to be able to inject information, to have more available, uh, more interaction between my, my, my automation and my users that are leveraging and working with it, okay? All right. Yeah, Jonathan went rogue. I see. I see. Uh, I don't see too many of your comments, unfortunately, while I'm doing the session. But I glance over occasionally, and Jonathan definitely went rogue on that one. Just kidding, Jonathan. You're you're good. That was actually what I was about to click anyway. So you, you saved me a second or two by doing that for me. All right. Cool. So the next piece that we're going to transition a bit into here, and I'm going to hope that I'm unblurry when I. Uh, no, I'm still blurry. Golly. All right. Let's take myself off camera if I'm going to be blurry. So the next section here that we're going to look at, though, is we're going to transition from talking about cloud flows to starting to get into desktop flows. So desktop flows aren't something that we've looked at yet. We've talked about them a little bit in the slides. I will actually bring up my slides for just one moment because I do have one or two slides around the Power Automate desktop. The Power Automate desktop is a separate application that you'll actually install on your machine. And if you remember back to what we discussed early on, there's going to be some specific use cases on when you do a desktop flow versus a cloud flow. So the thing that you're going to keep in mind when it comes to desktop flows and cloud flows is cloud flows are going to be used for your more modern application uh, that you're trying to automate. And then desktop flows are going to be used for more of those legacy applications that you don't have a very clear API that allows you to build out automations around. So that's really the differentiator whether or not you, you choose cloud flows or desktop flows. And it looks like my camera's behaving a little better now, so I'll put myself back on camera. I know you are really eager to see me, so I'll pull myself back on camera. But that's the big difference. Desktop flows are going to be for those more legacy applications that we all know a lot of our companies that have been around for decades have, and we just can't get rid of because they're so critical to the business. We want to build automations around them, but we have uh, just not a great way to inject automation capabilities. And that's where Power Automate Desktop comes into play. Now, Power Automate Desktop is an application that you will need to install on your machine. Some of you may not have that for today, and that's okay. You can come back and watch this section again later and, and do it on your own. The other thing that if you would like to participate, and Jonathan's going to share a link in the chat for you here in a few moments, is I am going to be showing how to build an automation around a legacy application that's actually part of a larger class that Microsoft has called RPA in a day. 
In fact, Jonathan and I actually taught this class just yesterday. And what RPA stands for, in case you're not familiar with that, is Robotic Process Automation. So uh, he's going to share a link in the chat to these class files that if you download them, there's a lot of extra supplemental material that will really be helpful to you if you're interested in learning more around desktop automations. And he, I can see he's put some links in the chat there for you. Actually, that, that reference is for a different piece, but he'll get the chat, uh, the link to RPA and a day files in there here in just a moment. So uh, in that class, you learn about how to build out desktop automations, automations that can can basically uh, uh, take the, the older applications you have and bring them up to date. Even if you can't get rid of them, you can still make them more of a modern application in some way. So what Power Automate Desktop does for you is it gives you a graphical interface for building out your automations through a desktop client. So there is a desktop client that you will need to install on your machine to follow along with this. One special note is that future versions of Windows, I believe even Windows 11 if I remember right, but somebody can correct me if I'm off on this, even uh, future versions of Windows are going to have the Power Automate Desktop automatically installed on your machine. So they're, they're making Power Automate Desktop as a regular Windows application that is there whenever you install Windows in the future. So what you're going to be able to do through Power Automate is build out these automations. You can have error handling in them. You can actually call on other scripting languages like PowerShell. You can call on VBScript. You can do Python in here. Uh, you have debugging techniques that you can do. But at its simplest level, you can do pretty easy, low-code, drag-and-drop uh, design of flows through the desktop application. And so that's what I want to show you in our next section, which is going to focus around building out automations through the desktop experience. All right. So let me go ahead and take this off my screen. Oh, I thought I had, actually, I might have not been sharing my screen for a moment. It was just one slide talking about the Power Automate desktop, so it's okay. All right, but here's what we're going to do is I'm going to now share my screen, the proper screen here, and we are going to be, at least for the moment, done with the web browser. So I'm going to minimize the web browser for a moment. I'm going to get Teams out of the way. We will come back to the web browser experience in a little bit because one of the things that I shared with you early on is that if you want to be able to run desktop flows, you will oftentimes have to integrate them in with Cloudflow. So I'm going to show you that experience as we get moving along as well. All right, so first things first. I am going to be launching the application on my machine called Power Automate Desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my Start menu. And we're going to launch Power Automate, not Power BI, but Power Automate Desktop. So the desktop application, when you open it, is going to require you to sign into your Power Automate account. Now, to be able to build out Power Automate Desktop solutions, there is a prerequisite that your environment that you're working with also has a Dataverse database. So I'm kind of feeding you some of the prerequisites to working with the Power Automate Desktop here. Is one, you have to make sure you have a Dataverse database within the environment that you're working on. And the reason why that's a requirement is because you have to be able to have the metadata for your uh, Automate solutions stored somewhere. And so the Dataverse database stores the metadata of your automations in that cloud database. Okay, so that's just one of your prerequisites is you have to have a Dataverse database in your environment. Now I'm going to go ahead and sign into my account. So I'm going to sign in to my Pragmatic Works account. You can, of course, have a trial where you can sign up as well. Uh, I will note that there is an extra level of licensing that you need to be able to do RPA or Power Automate Desktop. You'll want to look at the Power Automate uh, licensing website, and you'll see there's another level of licensing for RPA. So keep that in mind as well. All right, I'm going to go ahead and sign in to my account. And my two-factor authentication is going to pop up on me. Let me open up my phone for a moment for that. All right, we should be good now. All right, so this is the opening screen that you see when you launch the Power Automate desktop. When you first see this, this is going to show you your list of flows that you have already designed. Now, at the moment, I, I don't have any flows because we're kind of, kind of starting from square one here. But if you, saw, if you had any flows already previously created that would be desktop flows, you would see them listed here. So you're only going to see desktop flows created here. When you go to look from the web browser, uh, and you look at PowerAutomate.com, you'll actually see both desktop flows and cloud flows both showing up in the web experience. But we, if you ever want to edit a desktop flow, it's going to go back to your desktop application and launch that application for you to edit the desktop flows. All right, sorry, it's a little confusing. There's a lot of moving parts to this, but just note that you can see that desktop flows exist when you're looking from the web browser. You just can't edit them from the web browser. Okay. So our first step that we want to do is we want to create a flow. Now, before we just jump into creating a flow, I want to share with you our use case for this example. 
For this example, we are going to be automating a legacy application that I have on my machine, and it's uh, it comes from the RPA in a day class, that, which uh, Jonathan shared a link to the class files for that. You'll actually be able to find this application in those class files. But the application that we're going to be using is going to be called Contoso Invoicing. And so this is an old application. There's not really any API for it. It's been around with our company for decades, and we just can't seem to stomp it out and get rid of it. So we've, we've kind of uh, threw in the towel a little bit, and rather than trying to get rid of it and replace it, we are going to finally build some automations around it. So that way, at the very least, we have much less user interaction that has to happen with it. So what I'd like to automate with inside of this application is me entering in invoices. So right now, whenever I want to enter an invoice into this system, I have to go to the invoices node right here. So I would select invoices. Then I would come up to the top and I would say that I want to create a new invoice right here. So I would select new. And then I would enter the information for my invoice. So I could provide a date if it's something other than today's date. I could provide the account name so I can add in Devin's Donuts or something like that. I could put in, Devin's Donuts, by the way, are really good. I'm just going to let you know that. Uh, the contact, I could put in whoever the contact is, and then I can plug in my amount. And I think the contact is actually supposed to be an email address, it looks like. All right. Then I can plug in the amount. We can say that it's uh, $56.89, and then say that it's been invoiced, and hit save. All right, so everything that I'm showing you right now is not Power Automate. This is just a legacy application that I would like to automate. And I showed you the experience that my users have to do right now anytime they want to insert a new invoice. And so I want to make that experience a lot better for them. I want to try and automate some of these things for them. And so what I want to do is automate those steps that we just did. I want to even automate launching the application. So rather than my user having to open the application, Power Automate Desktop is going to open the application for me. Rather than entering in an invoice, the automation or the flow is going to enter the invoice in for me. Okay? All right, so let's flip back over to Power Automate Desktop now. And we're going to start by creating a new flow. So you can either hit new flow up on the top, or you can hit new flow down here on the bottom, whichever your preference is. Either way, go ahead and hit new flow. Now, when you do that, you do want to keep an eye on your environment. I am actually pointed right now to an environment. It's called Power Automate Learn with the Nerds. And that environment does have a Dataverse database part of it. If the environment that you have selected does not have a Dataverse database, you will not be able to create Power Automate desktop flows. So that is, again, a requirement that I mentioned earlier. I'm just kind of reiterating it now. So if you hit a roadblock, that could be one of the roadblocks that you have. Another roadblock could be the licensing level that you're using uh, here as well. All right, so we're going to go ahead and create a new flow now. And once we hit new flow, we can give the flow a name. So let's go ahead and call this flow, enter an invoice. All right, so this flow is going to automatically enter in invoices for us. So we'll go ahead and give it that name and then hit create. And ultimately what we're trying to do is we want to automate the process of launching the application and entering in that invoice for us. So we'll give it a few moments. What you're going to notice is it's going to launch a new interface for us. So this is a totally new window that we're seeing here now. And the window that it's launched open here for us is the editor or the designer for the Power Automate desktop. Now, a couple of things I want to point, you, point out to you here as we're looking with inside the tool. Uh, first thing that you'll notice is on the left-hand side are the actions. So this is a little bit different than Cloudflows. It's actually a lot different than Cloudflows because whenever you want to add an action, you will likely end up using this little search bar on the top and search for the action that you want up there because there are more than 400 different actions that you can choose from. So it might be most beneficial to you to actually search for the type of action you're interested in in the action section up on the top here. Otherwise, you're going to have to kind of siphon through all of these different actions here and find the ones that you want. And it can be a little difficult to find the ones you want if you have to search through all these actions on the left. But the action search bar will be a, a lifesaver for you, or a time saver, really. In the middle of your screen, you have your workspace. So this whole middle area right here is where you will actually start to drag and drop in the various actions that you want to use. So anytime you find an action that you would like to use with inside of your flow, you can either double click on it, or you can drag and drop it into the design surface in the workspace that you have in the middle of the screen. Okay. You also have this concept of subflows. So up at the top here, you can see that we have a subflow dropdown box. And what, the reason why you might consider doing subflows are, let's say, for example, you want to compartmentalize some of your work. So you want to 
Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, let's go with compartmentalize. I spelled that wrong. We're going to say, I'm going to say it out loud because I'm terrible at spelling, but you want to break up your word because another way of saying it. Okay. So if you have a rather large flow, a flow that has dozens of steps, maybe even a hundred different steps to it, that can be, as you can imagine, really difficult to be able to, to fig figure out what's going on within the flow. So if someone else were to pick up the flow after you and your flow has a hundred different steps in it, they're going to really struggle to figure out what the flow is doing. So subflows really help you kind of package up and compartmentalize some of your work, break it up into smaller chunks, and then you can have your main flow, that would be right here, run those various subflows that you create. The other benefit of creating subflows is you can have subflows run multiple times within inside of your main flow. So if you want to loop over a certain set of actions or if you want to basically just run your flow multiple times, not, maybe not even necessarily in a loop, but you can have a subflow run multiple times within inside of the main execution of a flow as well. So there's a couple different reasons why subflows are helpful. I actually have a video on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. But I actually have a video on our YouTube channel that talks specifically about subflows. And I spent about 15 minutes talking about nothing but that. So if you're really interested in subflows, check out that video on our U Pragmatic Works YouTube channel. All right. But that's the reason for subflows. We're not going to create any subflows in this example today, but you at least know the why they're there. The other thing that's worth highlighting is on the far right, you have, I'm going to zoom in on this for a moment. On the far right, you have three different tabs. Unfortunately, I didn't want this UI elements piece to pop up, so ignore that for just a moment. But you have three buttons on the top right. One is for variables. One is for something called UI elements, which is right there. And then the other one is for images. All right, so let's talk briefly about these three different items. I'm going to zoom in again without having my uh, mouse hover above that. So variables, as you can imagine, are used to make your execution of your flows dynamic. So if you want to be able to pass in dynamic values, if you want to be able to extract dynamic values, you're likely doing it with variables. We're going to talk a little bit more about variables later, so I'm not going to go too deep into them yet, but we will cover variables a little bit more as we make this example I'm going to show you more and more complex. But for now, just understand that variables are your way of making your flow executions dynamic. Okay. Below that is the option I mentioned called UI elements. What UI elements allow you to do is capture and rename even the different elements with, with, within the applications that you're trying to automate. And this will make more sense as we start to go through an example, but UI elements are basically the things that you click on whenever you are inside of the application. Whenever you go to click on something, whenever you go to type within a text box, those are all considered UI elements. And they're basically, pieces and parts of a UI design of an application. And those are captured there and you can rename them, you can change them, you can do what you want with UI elements. You'll see a little bit more about those as we go as well. And then images, the last one here, images is where you actually, anytime you go to click on a UI element, it will capture a picture or an image of that UI element as well. And you may or may not want to keep those images. You may want to delete certain images if they have, for instance, uh, private information in them. You can come in and actually delete or remove images if it captured them and you didn't want it to. All right, so looking good here. But we're going to focus first on creating a very basic example that will automate the entry of an invoice into our application that we looked at a few moments ago. So to get started, the first thing that we want to do is we want to launch that Contoso invoicing application. So if we want to launch a Contoso invoicing application, we can do that by going up to the action section on the top left, and we can search for launch, or actually, excuse me, run application. And if you search for run application, that'll take you much more directly to the action that we're interested in here. And we're gonna drag and drop, or you can double click, but we're gonna drag and drop the run application into the workspace design surface here. Now, as soon as you drag and drop that action into your design surface, you're going to have a pop-up that comes on your screen that we see on my screen right here. And within inside of that is where you will configure how, uh, what, what application is actually going to be launched. So what application is going to run? So you can navigate to your application right here. So right here, you would select what the application is that you want to launch. Uh, you would likely use this little file navigator button right here, and that'll allow you to navigate to the application you want to run. So you would go find the executable for the application here. And so we're going to go ahead and select that same button where it says select file, and we'll select the file for the application we want to run. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. 
And then I'm gonna go navigate to where my application is stored. Mine happens to be in my program files x86 folder. And it's also within side of my, let's see, x86, oh, right here, Contoso Incorporated, Contoso Invoicing, and then I have the actual application right here. So there's a legacy invoicing application. This is the application that I would like for it to run whenever this flow gets executed. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and run the legacy invoicing application here. And you can see here's the file path where it found where to run it. By the way, if you download those class files that Jonathan shared with you earlier, Jonathan, if you don't mind, put the, put the link to the class files for the RPA in a day uh, class again. If you find those files or download those files, this application this is actually in those files and you can follow this example later as well. So you can rewatch this if you'd like and you can run through this example again later. And whenever you install the Contoso invoicing application, it usually installs it in this exact same place. All right, so now what I'd like to do is I wanna tell it that I wanna go ahead and launch the application and I'm gonna save this action right here on the bottom. Now, before I do that, I wanna highlight one other thing and it's that you can notice right here that there is a variable that is going to be created automatically for me. And this is gonna be created in the flow variable section right here. Now, what a flow variable is, is it's a variable that's created internally with inside of this flow and it is only gonna be used with inside of this flow as well. So flow variables are not accessible outside of this flow. However, the other types of variables, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, these can actually have entries that can be accessed outside of the flow execution. So for example, you can pass in a variable value from outside of the flow into the flow whenever it actually runs. But flow variables are just kind of for internal use with inside of the flow itself. So what's happening with this flow variable that's being created is it's creating a variable called app process ID, which is gonna store the process ID for the application that we launch. And the reason why that's really helpful to me is I can use that same variable later to determine which process it is that I want to terminate when I'm done running the flow. Which is it that I wanna close, which application do I wanna close whenever I'm done running the flow? So by capturing this process ID, it ensures that it closes the same application that we launched in the beginning. Even if we have multiple Contoso invoicing applications opened, it's only gonna close the one that we opened initially. So pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and hit save, and that will create this first action to run our application. If we wanna test this out, you can save the flow. You can hit the save button up on the top here. And if you wanna just test this initial part out, which uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do, you can hit run and take your hands off the keyboard. I'll explain that here in a moment. But when you run the application or when you run the flow, it's gonna run the different steps that you have on the workspace area. So in this case, the only step that I had was to run the application and so it launched the application here for me. Now, one of the things you'll hear me say quite frequently as we go through this last 45 minutes of using the cloud, the desktop flows, is that you, I'm gonna recommend whenever you go to test a flow or you run a flow, take your hands off the keyboard and mouse because there is potential that you could interfere with what the flow is actually doing. So you might hear me say that multiple times. Every time you go to run the flow, take your hands off the keyboard and mouse, let it do its thing. Otherwise, you could actually interfere with it. There is another way of executing these desktop flows through a different mannerism called an unattended execution, which means that you don't you can run these flows without someone being signed in. And that is another way to prevent someone from potentially interfering with the execution of the flow. We will talk more about that later. All right, so now that I have my Contoso invoicing application open, I wanna actually build out the flow, the steps, the things that I'm gonna do here, the actions that we want to automate. And so one of the easiest ways to get started with this is to use the desktop recorder that you see right here. You'll also notice there's a, there's a web recorder as well if you wanted to automate some kind of a web automation. But in our case, we wanna automate a desktop application. So I'm gonna select the desktop recorder, which by the way, kind of looks works very similar to a macro recorder if you've worked with one of those inside of Excel. So if you've ever done like a recording of a macro in Excel, this is very kind of similar to that experience. So when I select the desktop recorder, it launches this new window on my screen and actually cleared the Power Automate desktop, it minimized the Power Automate desktop for me. But it does show the desktop recorder on my screen as the primary application. I also see my Contoso invoicing application on the right hand side here as well. And when you're ready to get started, you can click on the record button found right here, right there. And that will start to record all of the clicks that you do every time you interact with the application. So if I click on the record button, 
Notice now, whenever I go to my application that I want to automate, check this out. Look at this red rectangle that starts to appear within my application. So within my application, you're seeing this little red rectangle. And what that means, I'm not actually going to click yet, but what those red rectangles indicate is each time you click with inside of one of these rectangles, it's going to capture that click in the recording. And it's going to automate those clicks that you do. All right. So if I wanted to go to invoices, I would click on the word invoices here. And you'll see the red rectangle around invoices. And if I go to click it, you'll notice on the left hand side that it captured me clicking on the text invoices. And if I wanted to create a new invoice, I would come up to the top here with a new record button and I would click on new record and that will record me clicking on the image for the new record. So it's recording all of the different clicks that I do. Then I can go work my way over to the form and I can click with inside of the date field here. So if I wanted to potentially change the date, I want to record me clicking within the date field. And then one thing that I like to recommend that you do is be very deliberate with how you move from, from one area to a form to another area. Meaning what you would probably do if you were doing this in real life, you would probably hit the tab key and that would take you to the next element of the form. And that does technically work with Power Automate, but I like to recommend you get in the habit of very deliberately clicking within each section of the form. So if I were to click on amount here now and type in a new amount, let's say I typed in something like $899.95, it's going to record not only me clicking within that area, but also me typing in that specific text. And again, I recommend that you very deliberately click into the next area of the form rather than hitting the tab key. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on contact. I'll put in and plug in my email address here now. And then I'll go down to the amount. Oh, I made a mistake. You guys probably already spotted it. So. If you ever make a mistake like I just did, you can actually backtrack here in the recorder. I'm sure you guys spotted the mistake I made. Uh, but I accidentally typed in the account. I typed in the amount instead of the account. So if you ever make a mistake, I totally did that on purpose, uh, you can go over to the desktop recorder and you can eliminate those steps and kind of backtrack back to where you were. So here I can backtrack back to where I was. I can go back into, click into account and I can type in a new account name here rather than what I had. So I can type in uh, Pragmatic Works instead. And then I can type into the contact and I'll make sure I collect my uh, typing of the email address in here properly as well. All right, I made a little boo-boo, but I think we've corrected it here, hopefully so. Let's see, I think it actually did a little extra work. I'm gonna remove that step. I don't think that was a necessary step. That was me highlighting a value. I didn't need it to record that. Uh, I spelled pragmatic works wrong, that's okay. I'm not worried about that. But then under the amount, we'll go ahead and type in that amount that I had earlier, $899.95. And then we're gonna mark the status here as invoice. All right, once we've recorded all of those steps, we can hit finish in the desktop recorder and that will take all of those clicks that we just did and bring them into the Power Automate desktop. So now in the Power Automate desktop, you'll see all of those clicks that we just, just did are now showing up with inside of the desktop application. So every one of those clicks is now in here. And if I wanted to, I could actually run this desktop flow and see it enter in that information again. So I went ahead and closed the Contoso invoicing application. So that way when the very first action goes, it'll relaunch it here. So let's try this out. I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And I wanna make sure that the recording that I did was done properly, because I did make a little boo-boo there that I had to go back and fix. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens this time. So if I run this, I'm gonna take my hands off the keyboard. I'm hoping that it's gonna click on invoices, then create a new invoice, then enter in the new information, and it looks like it did that properly. All right, so we've got the skeleton of what we want our desktop flow to do. It's just kind of hard-coded everything. It's manually entering in the account and the contact and the amount. All of that is kind of, kind of hard-coded in our flow. But our next step that we're gonna do is we're going to actually build in some variables so we can make these values that we see right here dynamic. So I wanna dynamically pass in the account. I wanna dynamically pass in the contact email and dynamically pass in the amount using variables. So we're gonna end up replacing these with variables here in a few moments. But we got the initial flow working. So the initial flow, when we run it, it actually does pass in those hard-coded values. So we got a good start. All right, so let's talk a little bit about variables and making these things dynamic. 
if I wanted to make a variable so that I could influence and make this dynamic, there's a couple different ways you could do it. You could actually go ahead and edit this action and make the variable directly from within inside the action. Or you could actually go over to the variable section found right here and you can create your own variables. I'll take myself off screen here for a moment. You can create your own variables within the variables menu on the right hand side. Now you'll notice there's two different, really three different kinds of variables. You'll see flow variables right here and you'll see input and output variables above that. Uh, I described flow variables earlier, but just a quick repeat of what flow variables are. These are variables that are only accessible with inside of your flow, and generally you'll find that they are automatically created for you whenever you design the flow. So the, the flow itself, whenever you're designing it, will oftentimes automatically create those flow variables for you. The other kind of variables here, above that, input and output variables, I would consider these user-defined variables. So these are variables that you are going to define yourself and you're going to define them as either input or output variables to that. So that way you can determine whether you're trying to input values into the flow execution or are you trying to extract values out of the flow execution. So that's kind of the purpose of the input and output variables. And that's these are ones that are going to be user defined by you. All right. So if I want to create a couple flow variables, actually, I'm going to create several flow variables. We're going to create a total of four variables, uh, but three of them are going to be input variables, and one of them is going to be an output variable. So to create our first variable, we'll go ahead and click the plus sign right here. OK, I'll hit the plus sign. And we're going to add this as an input variable. You can see here, though, you can choose input or output. But we're going to go ahead and make this into an input variable. The first thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to go ahead and name the variable. Now you'll see there are two properties here that have to do with names. You'll have variable name and you'll have external name. All right, very briefly, the difference between those two. The variable name is the name as it will appear with inside of the flow. So whatever you name the variable name is what you will see it inside the flow. However, the external name can be something different. The external name is what's going to be used whenever you go to connect to this flow from other applications. Like for instance, if I were to run this desktop flow from a cloud flow, I'm going to see the external name there. So the external name is what's seen outside of the flow itself. All right. So you can have these have different names. They can have the same name. It really is just up to you. All right. All right. So we're going to go ahead and rename this variable and I'm going to call this one uh, let's call it uh, var for variable. And I'm going to put var in because it's an input variable. And we're going to call this amount. So var in amount. I'm going to make that my variable name. And I'm going to also make that my external name here as well. You can optionally give it a default value. I'm going to go ahead and give it some kind of default value. So that way when we're running this, it actually brings back something. So I'm going to put in $695.87, something like that. So I have a default value to this variable. As usual, anytime you see a description field, you should absolutely fill it out. Am I going to do that and waste time in our class? Probably not. But if someone were to come in and look at your flow after you, it, should be, it would be very helpful if you actually provided descriptions of each of your variables. So I do recommend you come in and add some kind of good description in here to give your users or your developers that are coming in after you some idea of what the flow is doing or more specifically, what this variable is doing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit that and hit create. One, one, one last note here, you'll see mark as sensitive. That would be if you're trying to pass in certain like user credentials. So if I had like a username and password and I didn't want that to be shown in plain text, you can mark that variable as sensitive and then you can pass it in to authenticate to various applications that you have and it will pass it in encrypted so that you so that nobody can come in and actually just see the username and password. So if you were working with sensitive data like that, you may mark as sensitive here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit create and create our first variable. You can see our new variable above my head here. So that new variable has now been created and we can start to leverage it. Now, I, like I told you that we're going to create several other variables. So I'm going to create three more. We're going to add another one by hitting the plus button right here this time. And we're going to select input again. And this variable that we're going to create is going to be our contact. So we're going to, again, call this var n. Var, oh, I can't, oh, I'm typing on the wrong thing. It's right here, var n. And this is going to be var n contact. 
And then we're gonna give it some kind of email address to use as the default value. We will also give the external name the same name as the internal name. But we're gonna give it a default value of, let's do my email address again. All right. And again, I recommend you add a description, but for the purpose of this, we'll go ahead and hit create because I got two more I gotta create here. All right, so we're gonna hit create on this. All we did on this one was we gave it a variable name, an external name, and we gave it a default value. All right, then I'll hit create. <clears throat> All right, we have one more input and one more output variable we're gonna create. So I'm gonna come back up to the top right and hit plus input again. And this variable in this case we're going to create is going to be our account. So we're gonna go ahead and type in the name of the variable here is gonna be var in account. Uh, by the way, me typing in var in is optional. That's just a kind of nomenclature to make sure that I know it's a variable and it's an input variable, but you don't have to type that in. You can just call this account if you wanted to. I'm gonna give it a external name that's the same, although they can be different. And then the default value that I'm gonna plug in here, I'm gonna make it, uh, let's do a pragmatic works for this time. And then I'll hit create. All right, so we have three input variables. We're now gonna create one final variable. This one's gonna be an output variable that's gonna give us something back. And the thing that I'm trying to get back from my application is I wanna extract out the invoice ID here. So whenever I go to insert the invoice, it generates an invoice ID for me. So I wanna pass in some information about the invoice and then what I'd like to get back, get back out, as an output variable is the invoice ID. So that's why we're trying to create this input and output variable uh, interface here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and create one more final variable. Again, that's gonna be back up here in the variables menu. We're gonna hit the plus sign and we're gonna add in an output variable. So this is the first one we've done as an output variable. So it's gonna be a little different this time. In fact, it's actually easier. Uh, in this case, there is no default value there, you're not trying to plug in anything, so there's no default value. All you have to do really here in this scenario is you're gonna provide a name, a name of the variable. So we'll call this var out, and we'll call this invoice. I, by the way, you cannot have spaces in your variable names. I forgot to mention that. No spaces are allowed. So we're gonna call this invoice ID, and I'll copy and paste that name down to the external name. All right. So once we've done that, I'll go ahead and hit create, and we have all of our variables created. We set the stage for really making this dynamic now. We did a little bit of the pre-work there. Now we're gonna go through and make some additional uh, swaps with inside of our flow to actually use that variable. Now before we go to use the variables, one thing I do recommend that you do is change the UI element names. And here is why that can be really helpful. If you're looking at our flow execution, notice what we have right here. Edit text box, edit text box two, edit text box three, edit text box four. How in the world are you supposed to know which one is which? So what I recommend that you do is pay a visit over to the UI element feature above my head right here. That's right here. I recommend you pay a little visit to the UI element section and rename each of those items. So that way it's really clear on what each element actually is. The nice thing about this is whenever you go to the UI element section here, and I'll take myself off screen for a moment. The nice thing about this is as you go into each of these sections, the reason I took myself off screen is you'll notice there is a screenshot that was sitting behind me. And this screenshot actually shows you what the different clicks were doing and where you were whenever you clicked on them. So this is why you may in some cases want to remove some of these screenshots because they could be capturing sensitive information. But in my case, it's fine. Uh, I don't need to make any change here. But what I do want to do is I want to rename these. So I want to note that this is the date and that text box two is the uh, account and text box three is actually bringing back the contact and text box four is bringing back the amount. So you can rename these UI elements by selecting them and then clicking on the three dot menu found right here. And that will allow you to rename these UI elements. So if I click on that, I can select that I want to rename the UI element right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. And I can give it a new name. Now, if I like the fact that it's identifying it as a text box, I can leave text box in here if I wanted to. And I can say text box uh, date. And I can come down here and I can rename this one. And I'll call this one text box. And we'll call this text box underscore account, something like that. 
So I can, can kind of continue to go forward and I can rename each of these. I'm not going to rename all of them, but I want to show you this is definitely a best practice to come through and rename each of these. So that way you can more easily understand what's going on with your flow. You'll notice every time I go to rename something, it's also renaming it in the flow over here as well. So see here, see here. So that way it's just a lot easier to actually identify things. I still need to do one more right here, but it makes it a lot easier to find the different elements that are within inside of your flow. All right, so we'll go ahead and rename this last one, then we'll move on. Just know you could rename all of these different things here. So I'm gonna rename this last text box and we'll call this one amount. All right. Cool, so now that we've renamed the UI elements, I can more easily look at the design surface here and understand which each of these steps or what each of these steps are actually doing. And so what I'd like to do is I want to rewire each of these steps that we see right here and right here and right here to replace the hard-coded text. You can see this is actually just hard-coded values that were typed in. And rather than using the hard-coded values, I want to switch them out for my variables. So I want to use the account variable. I want to use the contact variable. And I want to use the amount variable to replace the hard-coded text that we have in here. So that's the next step that we're about to do. So if I want to replace those hard-coded values, here's how we can do it. All you have to do is you can double-click on the action that you created. You can also right-click on it and select Edit. Both will work. But I'm just going to go ahead and double-click on the action. And when you double-click on the action, it will launch open the editor on the screen here where you can actually replace what is hard-coded in the original uh, definition of the flow. So when we originally defined the flow, it hard-coded in some values, but now we want to replace them with some dynamic values from our variables. So the way this works is you're going to see the hard-coded text right here. And if I want to get rid of that hard-coded text, I'll just backspace it out. And then you can replace it with a variable value right here. So if I want to replace it with a variable value, I'll go ahead and hit the select variable. And I'll find the variable that I want to replace it with. So if I want to replace this text box account, with my var in account variable found right here, I can double click on that variable name and it will play, replace the hard coded text with my dynamic variable. So I'll go ahead and double click on that. And there you go. So there's my new variable that's replacing the hard coded variable we had earlier. All right, so we'll go ahead and hit save on that. And you'll also see that new variable appearing right here as well. Okay, so we're making things dynamic here. That's the whole purpose of what we're doing. All right, the next step that I want to do is I want to do the same thing on this next action that has my contact email. So again, you can either double click or right click on the step and hit edit. And we're going to replace my hard coded email address, which I happen to type wrong anyways, with my dynamic one that's coming from my variable. So I'll go search in my variables menu here again, where it says select variable. And we will select our contact variable. That would be the one found right here. Okay, so we're just kind of swapping out hard coded values with dynamic values. And what we're going to see is once we get done creating this flow, we're going to be able to pass in values into the variable dynamically, including from our cloud flow. That's ultimately what we're trying to get to is show you from your cloud flow how you can execute these desktop flows. And when you do that, that means you can kind of integrate all of these different things together. You can integrate things like approvals with desktop flows, and you can do all sorts of stuff. Really impactful. All right, so let's go ahead and select our variable called var in contact. And you can see those percent signs there are identifying a variable, by the way. So we'll go ahead and hit save on that. And then we have one more final input variable to identify, which is right here. So we're going to go ahead and double click on this final action that has our amount. And we're going to replace the hard coded amount for $899.95 with our variable value, which we can find by hitting select variable and we'll double click on the amount variable right here. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and do that as well. I'm gonna go ahead and select the variable and double click on it, and that will place that variable value with inside of our action. All right, so let's hit save. All right, so we've now replaced hard-coded text with variables, but we had one more thing that we wanted to do, which was that we wanted to extract out the invoice ID. I want to capture the invoice ID that's created when it, or generated whenever we create a new invoice, and I want to pull it out because I might want to use it in other areas. Okay, So if I want to do something like that, I can extract values out of my application by using a different type of action. 
And we're going to go to the top left here and search for the action. The action that we're interested in this case is called get details of a UI element. And the one that we specifically are interested in is this one right here. Get details of a UI element uh, elements attribute in a window. Some of the difference between these two, by the way, some of these are for desktop applications. Some of them are for web applications. That's the difference between these two different types of flows here, or actions, I should say. All right, so we're going to go ahead and grab get details of a UI element in a window, and we're going to drag and drop that to the very bottom space over here of our flow. We're going to drag it to the very bottom, like so. Okay. Now, when you drag and place that new element or that new action with inside of your flow, it's going to immediately prompt you to provide what UI element are you trying to capture information from. So the element that we would like is we're going to hit this little drop down and you'll see these are all of the UI elements that we have already captured, but we want to capture one new one that we have yet to find. So we're going to select the option right here called add UI element. Okay. So if you're following along, click that box that I'm highlighting right there and I will do it as well. And what this is going to do is it's going to pop up on my screen something called a tracking session, which is very similar in some ways to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the desktop recorder that we saw earlier. So the way that we want to do this is we want to make it so that it captures the value that shows up on this invoice ID right here. Now, if you look very carefully, read the text here because it tells you to hover your mouse over the UI element and to capture it, you're going to do control left click. So I need to hit control left click on this ID column right here and that will capture it so that way I can pull values out of it. All right, so once you've captured that, you can hit done and it will bring that back into your desktop flow. All right. All right, so, thank you guys. I see someone's put a, a comment or to let us know that I have something wrong in my flow. I'll go capture that and fix that in just a moment. No problem, thank you guys. But I'm gonna hit save on this one. Oh, you guys, you guys got the eagle eyes there. Yeah, I totally missed that. This one is wrong, that's the wrong variable. So we'll, we'll fix that here in just a moment, but let's finish this process here. So we want to capture the uh, correct value from the invoice ID and pull it out. That's what we're trying to do. Now you'll notice that what this UI element did was it took the value and it put it into a new flow variable right here called attribute value. And what we want to do is we actually want to map that to another variable. We might want to use that somewhere else. Uh, you could actually use, there is a set variable uh, value that you can do or a set variable action that you can do. So if you ever wanted to take a variable from a flow variable and make it into a more traditional output variable like we have in our screen, we created an output variable, you can do that. Uh, you can even come over here and if you wanted to, you could kind of swap this out if you wanted to. But just to show you the experience of using the set variable action, I'm going to go up to the action section up in the top left. And I'm going to type in set variables. And I'm going to map, or set variable, I'm going to map the variable that we have, that we created in our final action into our uh, variable that we, called ha that we have called var out one here. All right, so the way that this is going to look, we're going to map these together. We're going to tell it that we want to take our variable that we already have uh, called, uh, what is it called, var out invoice ID, and we're going to try and connect it into um, the, the, the variable that we've already got here. All right, so to do this, we're going to go ahead and say that we want to set right here the invoice ID, our var out invoice ID, and we're going to set it to the attribute value, and that's the variable that was produced in our previous action that we did. So we're basically passing values between variables, and the reason why we need to do that is because one of them is a flow variable, one of them is an output variable, and that way is an output variable, it's accessible to other areas that we might need it. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go ahead and hit save. And thank you, Jonathan, for coming. Jo Jonathan came in with a whiteboard to let me know my mistake. I'm sorry, guys, it's hard for me to, to watch my demo and monitor the chat at the same time. So thank you for monitoring that for me and capturing my mistake. My mistake, if you didn't see it already, is right here. I used the wrong variable. So I just need to go in and switch that out. I'm going to switch this out. Instead of using the contact variable, we're instead going to use the amount variable. So good eye on you for that. 
Let me swap that out, and thank you, Jonathan, for letting me know. He, he physically came in with a whiteboard to let me know I was making a mistake. So that's, uh, that's our messaging system as we uh, go through this. He probably tried to send me a Teams message, and I'm just not looking at it. All right, but this is looking good now. Jonathan, you're the hero of the day. Uh, everything's looking fine, I think. So we can, if we wanted to, save this and go ahead and run it. So I'm going to go ahead and save this flow. Give it a moment to save. Remember, what it's saving is saving this actually back to our Dataverse database. That's where it's storing all this information. So it's storing it in our environment underneath the Dataverse database. It's collecting and storing all this information for us, uh, specifically the metadata of our flow design. So now I'm going to go ahead and close this Contoso invoicing app. We're going to run our flow. I'm going to take my hands off the keyboard, and let's see what happens. It launches. It then goes to insert an invoice next. There it goes. And it's using my variable values this time. So you'll notice that it's actually used the values from my variable rather than the hard-coded value. You'll also notice, if you pay close attention here, that the output variable has picked up the new invoice ID here properly. So we are seeing that the output or the extraction of a value from my application has worked as well. So really, really cool stuff, right? That is really neat that you can kind of pull, put in values and extract values all within inside of a desktop flow. Now, there's a lot of other things that we can do to go take a step further. So just to give you an idea of a few other things that we could do, I could also add in a terminate action. So I could add in a terminate process action. And the idea behind this terminate process is to close the app once I launch it. So I could bring that in and drag that down to the bottom to actually close the Contoso invoicing application once we're done with it. That would make sense. I would probably want to do that. And so I could specify in the terminate process that I wanted to process based on the process ID. And then I could map the process ID that was generated from my beginning part of my flow. And I can now set it got, first of all, it got sent in here and we're about to bring it back into the flow to terminate or close our application. So you can select the variable right here and tell it that you want to use the process ID variable to also close the same application that you originally opened in the very beginning. A few other things that can be helpful, you can add in weights. So there are weight actions. How these weight actions can be helpful, if you look over here on the left-hand side, these weight actions can be really helpful when you're doing things like web automation and you're waiting for particular uh, things to show up on the screen. You can actually wait for a certain UI element to show up. You can also do weights in regards to, hey, I want you to wait five seconds or 10 seconds or something like that. There's a lot of different things like that that you can do. You can also do uh, different debugging techniques. So sometimes I actually like to add in message boxes so you can add in your own little message box in here. It's called a display message way down here. And that way, what I like to do with the display message or the message box is to actually pop up and show me what the variable values look like as the flow is running. So there's a little few different techniques that you can use for debugging. Uh, one final little tip for you is you do have these things called breakpoints. So breakpoints, if you look carefully right here, I just added one. What breakpoints allow you to do is add little pauses in your flow execution. So if you wanted to add a breakpoint, say for example, I want to add a breakpoint right here, I can pause my flow's execution at that point and make sure that everything to that, to that uh, point has run correctly. And then if something for some reason is not happening the way I think it is, adding in these breakpoints add little pauses for me so that way I can kind of troubleshoot as the flow is running. So if I hit the run button this time, it's going to pause at the end or pause in the middle of it, and it's going to allow me to do some troubleshooting to make sure that things are happening as the way I would intend them to. So you're going to see my flow is going to pause right there. It stopped, and now I can go try and troubleshoot what's going on with my flow, and then whenever I think it's going, uh, whenever I'm ready for it to continue, I can hit the run button here again, and it'll run the rest of my flow. In fact, it also it, it fall, uh, picked up my last action there, and it closed the application at the end as well. So there's a lot of different techniques. I definitely recommend taking a peek at the RPA in a day class. That is actually one that we have recorded for free on our uh, learning management system. So if you would like to learn more about desktop flows, we did a full class just on this one topic, and we have recorded it and made it available for free forever. So I'm sure one of my colleagues that are in the chat can actually share a link where you can sign up for the RPA in a day class if you're really interested in learning more about that. All right. So we've covered uh, desktop flows for about 50 minutes. 
what I would like to do is show you how all of these puzzle pieces come together now. So how do we take a desktop flow and intermingle it with cloud flows? And then I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about administration and a few other tips that I have for you as well. But really our next step is to take this flow that we've designed and find a way to run it with inside of the cloud flow. Because if you remember from this morning, I told you cloud flows are gonna be the orchestration tool for your desktop flows because you're still gonna leverage the triggers that exist within inside of your cloud flows to determine when your desktop flows are gonna run. All right, so I've already saved this desktop flow. I'm gonna go ahead and close the editor down and I'll go ahead and save it again. I thought I already did save it, but I'll, I'll save it one more time. And we should be able to see this desktop flow now appearing in my list of flows within inside of the Power Automate desktop. We are actually done with the Power Automate desktop for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it out and we're gonna go circle back to the web browser where we were creating the cloud flows earlier. So I'm gonna go back over to my web browser right here. And I'm gonna go back to the Power Automate home for a moment, just so we can kind of reorient ourselves on where we are. If you're trying to keep up and maybe you're, maybe you're even watching this recording and you're trying to figure out where I'm at, just go to powerautomate.com and sign in. And this is kind of the experience that you'll see when you sign in. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a moment to kind of reorient where you are on my screen here. Now, I mentioned earlier that whenever you create desktop flows, you will see those desktop flows from within inside of your web browser. And you can find them when you go to your My Flows section right here. So if I go click on My Flows, I will not only be able to see the flows that we created earlier underneath the Cloud Flow section, but I will also see the desktop flows right next to them. And I should see my one desktop flow right here. Now, the thing that I mentioned earlier about desktop flows is whenever you want to edit a desktop flow, it, you cannot edit them from the web browser. What's gonna happen is if you click edit, it's actually gonna launch the Power Automate desktop again where you can make any changes you want to the flow. So keep that in mind. But what I'd really like to do for this next example <clears throat> is I wanna take a cloud flow or maybe I even create one from scratch and use that cloud flow to be able to execute a desktop flow. And so the, the bigger picture of what we're trying to envision here is how I can integrate the automation of some of my, my more modern applications with some of my legacy applications all together with inside of a single flow or maybe even across multiple flows. So for our example, we're gonna create a new cloud flow. And for this example, I'm gonna make it pretty basic. I'm gonna do just a manually executed flow. So I'm gonna come up to new flows and we're gonna select an instant flow an instant cloud flow right here, which means I'm not gonna have an automated trigger for this one. I'm gonna keep it simple because we've introduced a new topic. I'm not gonna try and make it any more complex now that we have this new type of flow we're dealing with. So I'm gonna go under instant flow and select instant cloud flow. And I'm gonna go ahead and give the flow a name. We will call this run my desktop flow. And I'm gonna use the manual trigger that you find at the very top. So we're gonna keep it very basic for this example. We're gonna use a manually triggered flow and then hit create. So this is gonna create a brand new cloud flow for me. That's kind of empty. All it has is just a manual trigger. But what we're gonna to add to it is a new step right here where I can actually initiate and add in an action to run my desktop flow. So I'm gonna go ahead and select new step right here. And we're gonna be searching for the desktop flow actions, which you can find by selecting this category right here. All right, so we're gonna select desktop flows. And you'll notice this does require a premium connector, but we're gonna be using the action here called run a flow built with Power Automate desktop. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and select that. Now, the big piece that I have not covered yet, which is actually pretty important, and I, 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 the reason I haven't covered yet is because I actually forgot, and this, this screen reminded me of it, is you need some way to be able to wire up your desktop flows to the cloud. So for those of you that have worked with tools like Power BI and Power Apps, and even Power Automate, you might have likely experienced that whenever you interact with applications that run on non-cloud sources, that you need to have something called a data gateway. And you'll notice that right now, it's actually prompting me to point to a data gateway that I can use for this. So if you wanna run desktop flows, you either need a data gateway installed on, the, on a workstation, or really on a server is ideal, or there's actually another option when it comes to Power Automate, which is called machine settings. 
And so you can actually set up a machine that will wire up and configure and tie your desktop flows to a cloud service. Now, the piece that I'm missing right now to be able to do this direct to machine option is I actually need to go to the Power Automate desktop, so I need to launch it one more time, and there is a setting that I need to turn on and configure to wire up this Power Automate flow, desktop flow, to the cloud. So I'm gonna go underneath the settings option found right here. Little piece I forgot to do, it's kind of important. We're gonna go underneath settings. And then we're going to go down to where it says open machine settings. Now, I'm going to stop here for a, moment, for a moment because some of you may not see this option, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this as a recording. If you do not see the open machine settings option like I'm seeing here, there's a couple reasons why it could be the case. Uh, one reason is that you may be running a version of Windows like Windows Home Edition. If you're running Windows Home Edition, you will not have this available to you. You're going to need to upgrade Windows to be able to do the machine settings. And again, the machine settings are wiring up and configuring your cloud service to the, uh, sorry, your desktop service, your on-premises service to the cloud. Some other reasons why you might not be able to do this well, it might depend on the permissions that your administrator has given you, but there can be a number of different reasons why the machine settings options may not be visible to you. All right, but for my case, I'm going to go ahead and select open machine settings right here. And I'm going to configure this machine to recognize the environment that has my desktop flow. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to select right here that we want to wire this up to my Power Automate Learn with the Nerds environment, like so. And then that way I'm basically connecting together my desktop solution to the cloud. And that allows me to run my desktop solution from the cloud. So we'll go ahead and wire that up. After a few moments, it usually takes about 10 or 15 seconds, you should see a little banner come across the top that tells you that you're connected. All right, so I'm gonna give that a few more seconds. And as soon as these machine settings, there it goes, as soon as these machine settings are wired up, I now have the ability to connect to this machine from the cloud. So it's very similar to the on-premises data gateway, but this is specific at the moment just to Power Automate. All right, but I, I really like it. I actually like this feature more than the on-premises data gateway. All right, so let's go back to the cloud now. Let's go back to my web browser for a moment. And now that we're back into the desk, uh, the uh, cloud, sorry, I'm getting it mixed up here. Now that I'm back in the cloud, I can point to my machine settings by selecting direct to machine. And then it should give me an option to see my machine. Now I have it here listed twice. I think that might be because I actually have done this more than once, but it should normally only appear here once. So I'm going to go ahead and select the Power Automate, uh, sorry, the uh, desktop or the machine settings for the machine I'm on. And then I'm going to go ahead and log in. Now, unfortunately, this is going to be an area that I cannot help you a lot with. I don't know what your login is, but the login that it's prompting you for here is going to be the login into your workstation. So if you log in with your Office 365 account, you will log in with that. If you log in with a different machine account, then you're going to specify whatever the account is that you use to log into your machine. For me, I log in with my Microsoft 365 account. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in here to connect me into my machine. And then I'll hit create. Now, when I hit create, this is going to create a connection that saves this information so I can use it later as well. So generally, you may be connecting into a different machine, not like your own personal workstation. You may actually set this up on a separate server to be able to run these desktop flows from. All right. All right, so now I have configured the connection. You can actually see the connection is listed over here now. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to select the desktop flow that I want to run. So I'll choose the desktop flow right here called enter and invoice. Perfect. And then I'm going to go ahead and select the run mode. And the run mode, you have two options. You can either run in attended mode or unattended mode. Very briefly, the difference between those two is attended mode means that you have to be logged in for it to actually run the automation. Unattended mode means that you can actually not be signed in. You can have it on, on, on you can have a machine that no one is signed into and he still needs to be turned on, but you can have a uh, machine that no one is signed into and it still be able to run flows from it. That is ideal, of course, but it does have an extra licensing cost to it. So you want to look into the licensing for that to make sure that you want to do that. For our purpose, I'm going to go ahead and say attended. And then look what we have here. I have a couple things in here that we can modify. I can actually add in 
my variables. So those input variables we saw earlier are actually visible here, including my descriptions. My terrible, my terrible description is actually visible here as well. So I can go ahead and type in here the amount that I want to pass in. So maybe I want to pass in $68.95. And maybe the contact this time is going to be, uh, I'll put it as myself again. And then I'll make the account Devin's Donuts again. I'm going to go back to Devin's Donuts. All right, we're almost done here, guys. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit save on that. And if I were to execute this flow now, so I'm going to go ahead and do a test on this, it will run my desktop flow for me from the cloud. So I'm going to hit test, say it's a manual test, and run it. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to run this flow, and it's going to connect into my desktop once I hit run flow, and execute that desktop flow for me. So I'm going to take my hands off the keyboard and mouse, let it do its thing, and it's going to actually pop open the Contoso invoicing application on my screen here in just a moment, and it's going to enter in those new values like 68.95 and Devin's Donuts are going to be passed in because I passed in these variable values from the flow execution itself. All right, so we should see it any moment. Actually, it already happened. It just opened in the background. There it goes. I'm going to take my hands off the keyboard. Look at that. So we ran our desktop flow now from the cloud. Pretty cool stuff. All right. I know we are out of time here, guys. One last thing that I did want to make sure I shared with you. I wanted to cover more on the administration side of things. One thing that I should have been doing this whole time, but I was saving it to the end, is I should have been using solutions. Solutions are your way of managing your work, being able to move your work from one environment to another environment. And so when you create a solution, this allows you to basically, basically package up your work. So I can call this my learn with the nerds solution. And you can add in each of the items that you create into your solution. So it's going to create basically a bucket where you can drop in your power apps that you develop, your power automate solutions you develop, and they can all be added into the solution. You can even add and create new items within the solution as well. But if you realize that solutions are really the best practice later, you can always come and add in existing items here as well. So I can add in existing cloud flows that I've already designed into this solution if I go underneath add existing. That really is a best practice to follow and put things into solutions. And then you can publish your solution and then add item uh, and actually move that solution from one environment to another. So if you have a development environment, you can create the solution there, uh, then migrate your work to your production or your develop or your uh, test environment by zipping it up into a solution. It actually saves it into a zip file for you. Wish we had a little bit more time to talk about that. I'm pretty sure we have some videos on that on our YouTube channel, but I know we are out of time. Hopefully you guys got a lot out of today. I know it's a lot of material to cover in one day. I do want to remind you again, of course, that uh, take a moment. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that bell for notifications so you know when we have new videos that come out. And don't forget, we do have that holiday sale going on uh, right now. You can go directly to pragmaticworks.com and sign up for our on-demand learning. That's half off right now for our annual subscription. So take a moment to do that. Hopefully you enjoyed today's class. Thank you so much for joining me, and we will see you next time. Thanks a lot.